the story of Horizon Zero Dawn. Where do you even begin? It's a story that's left an indelible mark on me, placing the series squarely on my top five list of all time favorites, put there by Zero Dawn, and further cemented by the triumph and even better overall game that is a sequel, Horizon Forbidden West. It's a story of mystery and discovery, triumph and setback, set in a beautiful yet dangerous post-apocalyptic open world, where human civilization has fallen into ruin, devolved into primitive tribes and nations of limited technological advancement. In this version of Earth, humanity is no longer the dominant force, living in the shadows of enormous animalistic machines. Well, we have our work cut out for us. It was a strange and yet oddly wonderful concept for an open world game back when it was announced at E3 2015, one that generated hype and excitement among gamers, but also brought about many questions. Many wondered whether such a wild concept would click, while others wondered if a female main character would be a good sell, with Sony later admitting reluctance with the idea. There was also the question as to whether the studio developing Zero Dawn, Guerrilla Games, could pull it off given their last major IP was the Killzone franchise, a purely first-person shooter series where Guerrilla had contracted outside writers for those stories. Then there came the question when both the release dates were finalized as to whether or not it could compete with this game. <sighs> Thankfully for Zero Dawn, due to the lack of switches available for sale at the time of release, it was afforded some breathing room to stand on its own when it was finally released on February 28, 2017. Upon release, Zero Dawn was received with widespread acclaim, with much of it centered on the story and writing, the world and its exploration, and characters, particularly the protagonist, Aloy, who has gone on to become one of gaming's most recognizable characters and one of Sony's most popular among its first party IPs. I'd argue that, in a sense, she's the proverbial queen of Sony Interactive, and no, I'm not just saying that because I'm a sucker for redheads. Maybe. The game was nominated for a boatload of awards, winning quite a few in the process, including a handful of Game of the Years. But most of these awards were centered around the game's narrative, which continues to be praised years later. It's a quality that has improved upon in its DLC expansion, The Frozen Wilds, and then expanded on with great success in Forbidden West. It's that aspect of the Horizon series that I want to focus on in the three videos I have planned for this series, starting with Zero Dawn. I will add in bits about gameplay when and where it's applicable, appropriate, or unavoidable as it pertains to the story, but beyond that, this video and the ones that will come after will almost exclusively be focused on the narrative and its minutia. It is my hope in this video and others to come that I can articulate and analyze their stories and game worlds, their successes, failures, and how they've improved from entry to entry, and how they might still be improved in the almost certain threequel. Also, it should be said, spoiler warning for all of Zero Dawn's main story, as well as some of its side quests, as well as cutscenes from the Frozen Wilds DLC and Forbidden West. I strongly recommend you play the game before watching this video, as its story is best experienced knowing nothing. Now, without further ado, let's get stuck in. Now all I have to do is make it all happen. What's that now? Don't like the cold? The story begins right from the moment you boot up the game for the first time. We're greeted by a man and a child exiting a house nestled amidst a snowy mountain range. His name is Ross, and he's taking the child, a girl, into the valley so that he can give her a name in some ritual. Though initial looks may be deceiving, Ross and the child are not father and daughter. This is made more clear later in the cinematic, but also hinted at in quick bits of dialogue just before they leave the house. Here. Wear this. It belonged to my daughter. As they descend into the valley proper, Rost explains that usually it's the mother who would give the child's name. In this child's case, however, there's a couple of problems. The child doesn't have a mother, and as Rost so aptly puts it, ritual, but we are outcasts. They then begin to cut through the remains of the old ones, the decaying ruins of human civilization from long ago. Ross couches their demise and ruin in the beliefs of their tribe, the Nora, describing them as wicked. Eventually, we come across the game's biggest selling point. Deal. 
From it, Rost instructs the girl to respect the power of their machines, to be humble in their presence. So far, this cinematic has done what I believe to be most important in such scenes, to lay the groundwork for the story in its world without overloading the player with too much information. This is a game that's built on a sense of mystery and discovery, and while Ross gives us plenty to chew on, he doesn't give away too much so as to spoil them. What we have learned with Definitive Certainty will play a huge part in the rest of the game moving forward, though what they mean isn't entirely clear as of yet. Another aspect of the game that's put on display in this sequence is just how goddamn beautiful it is. I mean, just look at this. Even now, many playthroughs later, I still often find myself stopping and staring at the world around me, or simply walking through its environments for no discernible reason beyond just soaking it all in. While not every aspect of the game graphically has aged gracefully, the world most certainly has. For now, we're only given a glimpse, but it serves well as a preview for what the player can expect down the road. Their power. I will teach you this. One day. Ross and the child begin to ascend up another mountain, first along developed paths, then up near sheer rock faces. While the ability to climb up such obstacles is almost a requirement in this world, I can't help but feel that, assuming this is a path everyone takes, it's a bit spartan of the Nora to make mothers carrying infants climb such an arduous path. Then again, this could be just a path Ross is taking due to their outcast status, the official path being far less rigorous and treacherous. Upon reaching the top, we find what appears to be a place of great religious significance to the Nora. They also find they're not alone. High Matriarch Tirsa is here, seemingly waiting for them. The Nora tribe has no one leader, instead being run by way of committee, that of the High Matriarchs, great-grandmothers who have at least three generations of progeny to their name. A Nora society that puts them head and shoulders above all others. As such, seeing Tirsa gives Ross cause to pause, as she could very easily forbid them from performing the ritual. Thankfully, Tirsa isn't there to stop them, but to actually bless the naming. She does so in a hurried manner, suggesting that she isn't meant to, though she doesn't seem to particularly care. I am a high matriarch, Rost. I bless whom I choose. Then you honor us. Yes, yes, now go, and be ready to declare. Go! At her insistence, Rost approaches the end of the overhang, child in his hands. At Tirsa's command, he holds her out towards the sun and calls out her name. Mother, this child needs a name by which to know her that your love may warm her life as the rising sun warms all the earth. Speak her name! Aloy! Aloy! So that's it. We can start the game now, right? Well, not quite. Stop this at once! Once the ritual is complete, another high mage shark, Landra, appears and immediately begins scolding Tirsa further adding credence that she wasn't meant to bless the child's naming, or that she hadn't informed anyone she was going to. Lanzar then venomously reminds Rost of his duty. I've done only what you asked. To raise it, yes. We said nothing of love. Enough. Lanzar is a direct foil to Tirsa, the two of them almost always butting heads whenever they're on screen together. Though at first glance it appears to be merely a personal clash between two powerful women, as we'll see later, it's far from being an isolated disagreement. Eventually, Tirsa intervenes, pulling Lanzar away from Ross, directing her fellow High Matriarch's ire away from a visibly upset little Aloy, where Ross soothes Aloy as the camera pans away from them, signaling the start of the game. And wherever you go, I will follow. The story then jumps forward six years later. We see a young Aloy spying a group of Nora children, gathering berries under the watchful eye of a Nora mother. Seeing the love and affection being afforded to one of the children, Aloy decides to join in. However, instead of receiving similar affection, she's greeted with sharp disdain from the mother, who quickly ushers the other children away. Aloy is, of course, still an outcast, someone to be shunned by the tribe, and this scene reinforces that fact. There. Come on. Understandably, Aloy does not take this well, and she runs off in a fit of mid-childhood anger, not unlike what I did when I realized how much being a millennial sucks. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Terribly shitty jokes aside, you'd have to be pretty callous to think there isn't anything wrong with the way she's been treated by the Nora thus far. 
I have plenty to say about the Nora as a whole later on, but needless to say, the tribe hasn't been portrayed in the most positive of light so far. Of course, this isn't enough to condemn an entire tribe, but what this scene does is lay the early foundations of Aloy's feelings towards the tribe as a whole, one that continues right the way through the series, even as she forms bonds with some of its members. Not paying attention to the surroundings, Aloy ends up tripping and falling down a massive cave. Thankfully, she falls into a pool of water below and is able to pull herself out, suffering no noticeable injuries despite doing no less than five barrel rolls on her way down. Ah! Ah! Oh! Quickly realizing that she's trapped, she decides to press on further into the cave in the hopes of finding an alternate way out. It doesn't take long for Aloy to realize that she didn't tumble down into an ordinary cave. This must be a ruin of the metal world. One of the old places. This is the first old world ruin we enter in the game, and it perfectly sets the tone for what excursions into such locations will be like. Whereas the world above is flush with color and full of life, the ruins of the metal world are bleak, dark places, devoid of any life, leaving behind an unnerving husk of what once was. This stark juxtaposition can also be found in terms of space. The wider world above is open and free, almost limitless. Conversely, the old world ruins below are cramped, oppressive spaces, interconnected by often narrow corridors with low ceilings. Entering an enlarged chamber, Aloy makes a startling discovery. A dead person. For all that is bright and beautiful in this series, there is much that is grim, depressing, and distressing in these games, which we'll see more of later on. Of course, this isn't surprising when you consider that apocalypses aren't exactly non-violent occurrences, the discovery of this body being a visceral reminder. Approaching the body, Aloy makes a follow-up discovery, one that will change her life forever. A focus, a tiny piece of old world tech that allows the wearer to see things that usually can't be seen, doing so in some form of augmented reality. Without getting into the nuts and bolts of it, think of it like your smartphone packed together into a tiny device that attaches to your temple, showing you vast quantities of data in real time. How this works is never explained, nor how they could still be working hundreds of years later, but at this juncture, none of these points matter, for at this moment, Aloy is simply awestruck by what she's seeing. Glowing lights appear everywhere, and she takes a moment to gaze upon them before we press on. Everywhere. How does it do this? What follows is our first puzzle door, a ridiculously easy one at that, but I consider it to be acceptable given that its purpose is to merely showcase one of the focus's capabilities, as well as showing the player how puzzle doors will work. On the whole, I don't really have an opinion on them. I generally dislike puzzles in games, so I don't mind when they lean on the basic and mundane, though I can understand why someone else might be left disappointed. After completing the door, Aloy reaches a junction point of multiple corridors. It's here that we encounter our first data point. I'll discuss later how Zero Dawn's data points succeed as lore dumps compared to other games, but for now we can ignore this one. After going down a flight of stairs, Aloy comes across yet another chamber, an office of some kind, and finds another body, also with the focus, and another data point. You think I want it this way? It's the best I can do. He's right behind you. Hi! <laughs> Happy birthday, Isaac. Daddy sure does love his little big man. Look, Daddy can't be there with you and Mom, but we can still have a party, right? <laughs> sure we can. <laughs> Show me. Show me again. I can do. He's right behind you. Happy birthday, Isaac. Daddy sure does love his little big man. Look, Daddy can't be there with you and Mom, but we can still have a party, right? <laughs> sure we can. Happy birthday, Isaac. Daddy sure does love his little big man. Now we could easily dismiss this hologram as just a glimpse into the old world, but it's pretty clear that it's much more than that to Aloy. It's a parent showing love and affection to his child. Regardless that it's not directed to her specifically and that the man isn't actually there, she still feels this love and affection, two things that have been denied to her thus far. I mean, look how happy it makes her and how quickly she replays it. Coming shortly after the scene with the Nora mother up top, this hologram is giving greater emotional weight and will be called back upon later in the series. 
Moving on, Aloy comes across two more data points, and it's from here we begin to ask questions of just what happened here. The first one doesn't reveal much, but the second one ends dramatically with the guy shooting himself. And Mark, so if that upsets whoever finds this, too bad. I don't know anyone, anything, anymore. By now it's pretty clear that the people of this room didn't get much of a happy ending. Soon after we enter what appears to be some sort of sleeping area. All of the bodies within the room contain data points, their content suggesting that these were their final words, all while under the influence of something. We don't know what that something is, but if you return to this ruin later on when Aloy is older, you can find the answer on a data point in a previously inaccessible office. While optional, you'd be remiss if you didn't listen to them. Though vague in their meaning, they plant a seed in the player's mind, giving you something to chew on while compelling you to ask questions and subsequently push on for the answers. The God who Exiting the room and traversing a string of corridors, Aloy hears a familiar voice. Aloy! Aloy! He found me! Rost is found her and is more than a little thankful for it. The Nora revile the metal world, considering such ruins cursed places, symbols of the hubris and wickedness of the old ones. This clearly hasn't been transposed onto Aloy, for even as she hurries to reach Ross, she still stops and looks back into the cave with curiosity. Of course, Ross doesn't feel the same way, reminding Aloy that such places are forbidden. Then he notices the focus. What is that on your face? Nothing. Did you find it down there? No. Give it to me. No. Aloy, such things are dangerous. No! Seeing that he isn't about to win, Ross lets the matter go, deciding that now is the time to start training Aloy on the art of survival. Come Aloy, home now. But starting tomorrow, you will learn to hunt. For the next 10 minutes or so of gameplay, Ross teaches Aloy about the basics of survival. Gathering healing herbs, crafting ammo, hiding from machines and moving in stealth, and controlling a machine's intention by throwing rocks. We also learn how we can use the focus to pinpoint weak spots on machines, which rankles Ross somewhat. The canister on its back. Is that a weakness? Yes. How did you guess that? The device. It showed me. That plaything? Stop playing games. You'll have probably realized by now that this entire sequence so far has been one long tutorial segment, supplemented with ample world building and storytelling. This has drawn criticism, suggesting that it overstates its welcome and isn't interesting. While this is true in subsequent runs, I think we need to look at the game doing more than teaching players its gameplay systems. It's doing that, while also continuing to build on the themes established in both the opening cinematic and at the very beginning of this very sequence. Its effectiveness will largely be dependent on the player, but I think it definitely works on a first playthrough. After completing Baby's first machine hunt, both Rost and Aloy hear a scream further down the valley. We train again. What was that? Rushing to investigate, they come across a large clearing full of striders and patrolling watchers. Across the clearing, they find a boy, who they saw earlier in the valley running the brave trails, hanging by his fingertips, desperately trying to regain his hold. Surprise, he fails and falls into the clearing, alerting the already jumpy striders. Unfortunately, Ross states he can't do anything. It's only a matter of time before the machines find that boy and kick him to death. But if I shoot, It'll cause a stampede, and it will trample him. However, with the use of the focus, Aloy can see the path the machines take, and jumps down into the clearing anyways, but not before Ross grabs her bow. This next section offers nothing in the way of story, instead simply being an amalgamation of everything you've just learned about stealth, now with the added ability to highlight machine paths. Though I don't have any footage to show, I will add that if my memory serves me right, if you get caught by either a Watcher or Strider, it's an automatic game over and you have to start again. Beyond that, it's a fairly bog standard sequence. You reach the boy and lead him back to Rost, who has repositioned himself on the east side of the clearing. The boy, understandably, is more than a little grateful for Aloy's efforts. A trio of Nora Braves soon arrive, with one of them immediately berating the boy for speaking to them, because shunning outcasts isn't just some societal trait of the Nora. 
It's against tribal law to even speak to them, punishable by being made outcast yourself. You even learn later on in a couple of side quests that outcasts aren't even allowed to speak to one another themselves. The braid then goes a step further. And she is motherless. Just like anyone would be in her shoes, Aloy doesn't take to being called motherless all too well, and storms off in a huff along the path home, with Rost not far behind. While meandering on the path home, Aloy is greeted by a familiar face. Stay away, no mother! Remember that blonde-haired youngin from before? His name's Bost. Here he is, being an ass with a shit-eating grin to match. I won't dig into him too much because, let's face it, some children are just plain jerks at that age. Let's give him a chance to mature into a fine young brave, but not before he throws another rock at Aloy's head. This time, however, Aloy deftly catches it. It's here that we're introduced to flashpoints. Their explanation on screen is pretty much the long and short of it. They are simply a means to allow the player to express Aloy's personality however they like within the confines of these three choices. To be clear, these are not decisions with choice and consequence and will not determine how the main story or side quests end. What happens with these choices are confined to their assigned story beats, allowing for some limited role playing. While they do allow a limited amount of variance over multiple playthroughs and often have great bits of dialogue attached to them, they don't offer much more than that. I don't hate them, for I'll never say no to giving players choices, but I don't think anything would have been lost by their exclusion. In this instance, I chose the brain option, or insight, having Aloy throw the rock she caught back at Boss, knocking the rock he just picked up out of his hand. Aloy looks on with satisfaction, though this quickly evaporates once the other children are called away and Ross catches up. He immediately attends to the wound on Aloy's forehead, which begins this conversation. I'll get it. Why? Shh. Why am I an outcast? Aloy, this is not the time. Who was my mother? Aloy, I've told you before, that's not for us to know. You were just a newborn when the Matriarchs brought you to me. So the Matriarchs, they know? <sighs> it's not so simple. But they know! Aloy, we are outcasts. So how do I make them tell me? The Matriarchs? There is a way, perhaps. So tell me! It will be dangerous. How? It would take years of training. I don't care. How do I do it? Tell me. The proving. The tribe's rite of passage held every year. Those who pass become braves. But to the one who wins, the matriarchs grant a boon. A boon? Yes, whatever the winner wants. Then I'll do it. <laughs> whatever it takes. I'll win the proving. I see. We'd best get started then. Your training will be hard. And it'll take years. Start training? Yes. Follow. From there we get a well-crafted cinematic sequence showcasing Aloy's subsequent training. I love the cinematic, how it starts with Aloy struggling to master the skills necessary for the proving, then gradually improving, before when she's a young adult finally mastering these abilities and executing them flawlessly, while Ross looks on with pride. It also serves as an excellent narrative transition, capping off the end of the prologue with a flourish, while almost seamlessly guiding us into Act 1. Act 1 begins almost mirror to the prologue. Beginning right after the previous cinematic, we see Aloy exiting the same house as we see in the opening, calling after Rost. If you remember from the beginning of the prologue, it was Rost who was calling Aloy's name as she slinked away from home. Now it's seen the roles are reversed. Nevertheless, Aloy pushes on down the path leading from the house, wondering aloud where Rost is gone. He said we'd go hunting this morning. Why isn't he here? Where's he gone to? Aloy talking to herself is something she does a lot, both in Zero Dawn and Forbidden West, which has been the source of criticism by some as simply being annoying and unnecessary. I personally disagree with this sentiment, partially because I connect with this on a personal level. I too talk to myself a bit, especially while I'm working, as I find verbalizing information often helps me process it far more quickly and efficiently. There's also another layer to this, that which I hope is obvious. Apart from herself, Aloy hasn't had anyone to talk to. Yeah, Rost is there, but he can only relate to her so much. There's also Karst, the only Nora merchant that will actually speak to her at the start, but their relationship is strictly mercantile. Combine that with being actively shunned by the rest of the tribe and, well, 
she's only got herself. This lack of people to talk to will of course change over the course of the story, but by now it's become a habit that's well entrenched. Haley quickly finds Ross standing atop a nearby cliff. He's in fact waiting for her and tells her that he has one more lesson for her just before she heads off to the proving. Aloy is more than willing to learn this lesson, and with that, Rost instructs her to descend into the embrace and gather the parts necessary to craft fire arrows, then meet him at a gate near a place called Mother's Heart, staying rather mum on what this lesson is when Aloy asks. With that, Aloy descends further into the valley. It's here that the world finally opens up to us, but not completely. Aloy and Ross live in a region of Nora territory called the Embrace. It is in essence the beating heart of the Nora sacred lands, centered around Old Mother Mountain, the tribe's most important religious site, as well as its largest settlement, Mother's Heart. Besides its cultural and religious importance, the Embrace is also incredibly defensible, surrounded by mountains on three sides, with the eastern side defended by three gates at various choke points along the eastern Embrace's still rugged terrain. These defenses, natural or otherwise, keep Aloy inside the Embrace for at least the first few hours. It serves as a microcosm of the wider open world, with a few side quests here and there, as well as going over basic mechanics that weren't covered in the prologue. Mother's Heart is currently close to you, but there is another settlement you can explore called Mother's Cradle, even though its residents make it very clear that Aloy is far from welcome. Keeping the player contained within a smaller area at the start is something that I think goes underappreciated in some open worlds, particularly in a narrative and world building sense. Of course this isn't going to be for everyone, especially when compared to open world sandboxes like Skyrim or Fallout 4. That's fine, but in a game like Horizon Zero Dawn, which has a greater emphasis on its main story, keeping the player in a contained portion of its world, even if only for a few hours, gives the player a chance to get properly settled in, to get themselves immersed, and not to be overwhelmed so quickly. This is something other narrative-heavy open world games have done extremely well, The Witcher 3's opening area of White Orchard being a perfect example. Once she's gathered the parts she needs, Aloy meets Ross at a campfire on the path to the North Gate. As you approach, you can hear the sounds of distant fighting beyond the embrace. Aloy can ask Ross what the fuss is about, but as has been standard so far, Ross remains rather tight-lipped. It's also here that Aloy can lay out her plans of continuing to see Ross once she's run in the Proving and is no longer an outcast. Despite some early resistance to the plan, Ross eventually relents. Sort of. Once night falls, they approach the gate, which the defending braves open for them, much to Aloy's surprise, considering that the guards are under no obligation to do so for outcasts. To that, Ross says, some who are shunned reaped honor before disgrace. Which suggests that he was once a well-respected member of the Nora prior to becoming an outcast. How and why he's an outcast isn't revealed until towards the end of the main story. A further twist to that is his sentence is for life, something that even to the Nora is quite unusual and extreme. You can ask multiple people about it long before them, but they either don't know, or in the case of Rost and the High Matriarchs, are under oath to never speak of it. The fact that even as an outcast, Ross still commands a level of respect from the other Nora suggests that maybe his disgrace isn't what it truly means. Beyond the gate, we meet this monster. A Sawtooth, a relatively new machine that has already caused considerable havoc to the tribe. This is made clear by the multiple destroyed cabins and lodgings, along with more than a few Nora corpses littered along the path. Following the path of destruction, you come across a clearing where Aloy comes face to face with her quarry. As part of the lesson, Ross backs off, telling Aloy that she's on her own. Depending on your skill level, this fight will either be a walk in the park, or an extended learning experience. Either way, the end result is the same. With the Sawtooth dead, Aloy immediately begins to strip it for parts, just as Ross appears from whatever bush he was hanging out in. He begins asking Aloy if she knows why he brought her there, with Aloy first being a bit of a smartass, before giving what she thinks is the answer. It isn't, of course, because why would it be? As Ross puts it, Aloy has been training to win the Proving, but only for herself. The lesson was to remind Aloy that, once the Proving is over, she'll have to think beyond herself, to fight for the tribe. It will be your duty to fight for your tribe. My tribe? You said I wouldn't need them. I can imagine Aloy wants to go on some sort of diatribe here, against the same tribe that made her an outcast, but stops herself, probably so as to not disrespect Rost. Perhaps sensing this, Rost ends the lesson with this. The tribe wouldn't need you. The strength to stand alone, Aloy, is the strength to make a stand. To serve a purpose greater than yourself. That is the lesson you must learn. And remember it. After the proving. And after I'm gone. Once back inside the embrace, Aloy and Ross will have one final chit chat before agreeing to meet just outside Mother's Heart. From here, Aloy is free to wander the embrace some more, with the option to head to Mother's Heart at her and the player's leisure. For what's considered a primitive settlement by the standards of other tribes, Mother's Heart holds a rather imposing presence, starkly set against the mountains behind it. 
This is accentuated by the rumble of drums that slowly builds as you approach, signifying that celebrations are well and truly underway. Ross is waiting just before the bridge. This will be your last chance to delay heading to the Proving, for you'll be locked into the quest once you enter Mother's Heart. That's not to say you won't be able to return here once it's over. Quite the contrary, actually. You'll still be in the embrace once you're free to explore again, and any side quests you've left unfinished will be waiting for you. What proceeds before you head in is one of the hardest scenes to watch in the entire game. I'm ready to do this. See you back home in a few days? You will not find me there, Aloy. Here. Take this. Remember. Why are you talking like we'll never see each other again? No. No! You should be with the tribe. And I will always be an outcast. But I told you, I have that figured out. I'll come to you in secret. I'll be the one breaking the law, not you. You don't even have to talk to me. This attachment to me will only hold you back. It's my wish that you embrace the tribe. You've lived in isolation long enough. Not until now, I didn't. For your sake, I must go where you will never find me. This... This is goodbye. I see. I'm... glad to have this then. It will... remind me of you. Of everything you did. And how you helped prepare me for this day. Thank you. Heavier than it looks. But the cord is strong. May all mother bless you, Eli. And you. Regardless of whichever choice you make, it's a tough watch. You can feel Aloy's pain as she tries to keep Ross from leaving. He's been the only constant that she's ever had, raising her from birth, teaching her how to survive, training her for this very day, and now he's gone. Just like that. As Aloy watches him leave, I imagine she contemplates dropping everything she's ever wanted just to go after him, to keep that constant alive. If that's the case, she ultimately decides against it and recedes to the main gate. As she approaches, she's greeted by two Nora Braves who are quick to bar entry. You will turn back, outcast. Thankfully, the gates are opened and... Look who it is. Tirsa. Remember her? If not, she's the high matriarch who blessed Aloy's naming in the opening cutscene. She quickly orders the Braves to make way and welcomes Aloy into Mother's heart, telling her that she's been waiting for this day a long time. Clearly confused, Aloy follows her inside. Just as quickly as she arrives, however, Tirsa leaves Aloy to take care of some outsiders, envoys from another tribe. Before she disappears, however, she tells Aloy that an old friend of hers is waiting for her further along the path, and that he can't wait to see her. From the outset, this doesn't make any sense since Aloy, in theory, doesn't know anyone there. May the goddess protect. What is going on? We'll just have to wait and see what that's about for now as we're given free reign to wander around Mother's Heart, albeit on a somewhat linear path. Fittingly for what is probably the tribe's most important festival of the year, Mother's Heart is in a suitably festive mood, with musicians, singers, and dancers entertaining the Nora masses, keeping them in fine spirits, along with a seemingly endless supply of food and drink. It wouldn't surprise me if this is the sort of festival that the tribe spends all year planning for, beginning preparations for the next one as soon as the last one has ended. This is all further enhanced by a host of other bespoke animations of people conversing around fires and long tables. This is also wonderful in bringing the settlement to life, while providing a glimpse into Nora life, something that is, as of this moment, alien to Aloy and the player. It also makes what it's like after the proving all the more stark. Moseying along, we come across Aloy's old friend. Aloy! It's you, isn't it? Over here. Major. Yep, that's right. It's the boy we saved back in the prologue. His name's Teb, and as we can see, he didn't become a hunter, but a stitcher instead, someone who makes clothing and armor. As a long overdue thank you, he's made some armor for Aloy. He then directs her towards the Matriarch's Lodge, where Tirsus should be. He also mentions that she'll find an angry mob there, angry at the presence of the foreign envoys. Upon reaching the mob in the lodge, we see both Tirsa and fellow High Matriarch Jezza inviting the visiting envoys to speak before the assembled Nora. 
They've come under a banner of peace, though if you were listening to idle chatter around Mother's Heart, it's clear that most of the Nora don't feel the same way. One of the envoys, a Karja sun priest, then steps forward. An annunciation of gratitude written Killers by and the slavers. hand of yeah. Sun King yeah. of Killers and slavers! Hey, hey, of hold your fruit, Nora. Uh, uh, Nora faithful, hold your fruit. Now I'm Azaram, not Karja, so I'll put it to you straight. The 13th Sun King was a murderous bung. Oh, he was. He was a tyrant and a monster. Raided my tribe for blood sacrifice, just like yours. My own sister was taken. I hated the Karja. But the 13th King is dead. Two years now. now who killed him? The 14th. Not because he, he lusted for power, but because someone had to put an end to his father's atrocities. Yeah! yeah. The message that this poor priest means to read is an apology. Straight from the lips of the 14th kid. So please, can't you lend him your ears? Hey, thank you. <clears throat> an enunciation of gratitude Written by the hand of Sun King. As the Sun Priest continues his speech, Aloy notices something peculiar on her focus, a signal emanating from one of the other visitors, not on stage, but languishing off to the side. As she gets closer to investigate, she sees that the man is also wearing a focus. Huh. His name's Olin, a delver and scout from the Osram tribe. When Aloy confronts him about his focus, he's beyond shocked that a Nora would be wearing one, since that possibly means Aloy's been down in the ruins of the Old World, which is something that the Nora just don't do. To that, Aloy wittily replies. Who says I'm like other Nora? Before they can continue, something happens with Olin's focus, which he awkwardly brushes off as a malfunction. It's then that one of the visitors on stage appears, and Olin is quick to exit stage left, suddenly worried about something. It's here we turn our attention to this fine fella. This is Arend, another Osiram, a member of the Vanguard, Sun King of Odds, personal guards, and a favorite of fans of the series, myself included. There isn't much in this conversation that expands or progresses the story, at least not at first glance, but alternate dialogue options provide a chance for the player to learn about the world and its lore alongside Aloy. This sort of world building, where information is dumped on the player in long, dialogue-heavy expositions, is something that has become a bit of a hot-button topic for gamers, with some loving it and others hating it. It works in Zero Dawn for two reasons. One, being an outcast, Aloy has had no prior knowledge of the outside world, and two, piggybacking off the first point, Aloy is naturally curious, and as such, asks a lot of questions. There's a lot of information in this conversation should you wish to engage with it. It's presented rather well, and you'd be missing key contacts for later story moments if you don't. However, it can feel somewhat disjointed depending on the order you engage it with. With that said, allow me to go over it in as brief of a summation as I can. According to Aaron, some 15-20 years ago, something happened that made the machines angry. They were already dangerous, of course, but only if you didn't know how to jump out of the way. Then suddenly, out of the blue it seemed, the machines began to intentionally attack humans, making travel an incredibly dangerous endeavor. To top it all off, new machines like the Sawtooth began to appear, bigger, badder, and armed to the teeth. This has since become known as the Derangement, and the tribes of this world have been trying to make sense of it ever since. One of these tribes, the Karja, eventually took matters into their own hands. Karja religion is centered on worshipping the sun, with their sun king serving as its vessel. Seeing the derangement as divine punishment, Sun King Jaron decided that blood sacrifice was needed to appease both the sun and the machines. By this time, Jaron was presumably already going mad, seeing himself as a literal sun god, not just a vessel. The blood sacrifices that followed started out domestically, but when this did nothing, Jaron shifted his focus on tribes beyond Karja borders. These became known as the Red Raids, and over the course of 10 years, the Karja took thousands of prisoners, transporting them to the Sundom to either become slave labor or to be sacrificed. Of course, the other tribes made every effort to resist. However, against the military might of the Karja, all they could do was weather the storm, in the hopes that eventually the Karja would tire of it. When the breaking point finally did come, it was thanks to Jaron's own madness-induced stupidity. His cruelty did not stop at his family, and when his eldest son and heir, Prince Kataman, demanded an end to the bloodshed, Jaron threw him in the sunring. This compelled his second son, Avad, to flee to the Osram homeland of the Claim. There he met up with Ursa, an Osram woman who had miraculously survived the sunring and whom Avad had helped to escape slavery. She's also Aaron's sister and current captain of the Vanguard. With Ursa and Aaron, Avad formed an alliance of Osram warlords and freebooters and marched on Meridian. Their numbers swelled along the way by distant Karja, culminating with the capture of Meridian, known in the series as the Liberation. 
While a fair few of his loyalists escaped the city, Jaron's madness would not allow him to surrender, and thus he was slain by Avad. Allegedly. With the Mad Sun King dead and Avad crowned the 14th Sun King, the Red Raids were finally brought to an end. But as we'll see throughout the rest of Zero Dawn, as well as Forbidden West, the ramifications of the war are still being felt, both within and without the Sundom. After talking with Erend, it's time for Aloy to head to the Blessing. Here you'll find all the aspirants gathered together in a sort of courtyard, each with a lantern. What follows is quite a beautiful scene, the lanterns floating into the night sky as the High Matriarchs recite the Blessing. After this, Aloy has a chance to speak with a few people, including Tirsa. This will be the first time that Aloy can actually speak to her at length, and it's here that we learn about the Nora's hierarchy, how having multiple generations of living progeny lends more power. I'm going to be perhaps a little too honest here and say that I find the idea of more children equals more power to be detestable to me, and yet I have to be honest with myself and recognize that I'm looking at it through the lenses of my own modern day perspective. This is an extremely dangerous world for humans, and I can only imagine, back when Norse society was beginning to take shape, that the infant mortality rate would have been through the roof. This would have undoubtedly lent credence to the idea that if you had lots of living progeny, that you clearly knew what you were doing and should be listened to. Coupled with their worship of Old Mother, then the concept begins to make sense. Yet this comes with an inherent flaw, that just because you have lots of living progeny does not mean you're inherently suited or right to lead. Of course, this is hard to parse with the Nora given that they appear to have maintained a steady existence for the last few hundred years. That flaw can also be hand-waved away by the fact that the Nora are ruled by committee, not one person, but given their strict adherence to tribal law and isolationist tendencies, I'd have to disagree. Even Tirsa, who's the clear reformist among the high matriarchs and the most willing to break taboo, often leans on that tradition more than she probably should. Now before you stab your fingers into your keyboards and call me out, no this is not me railing against women being in charge like some incel spewing bullshit on Twitter or Reddit. In fact, I can still remember on my very first playthrough quite liking the idea of a matriarchal leadership structure. It was something new and fresh, something that to my knowledge hadn't been done before in gaming, or any mainstream fiction for that matter. As hyperbolic as it may sound, I think Gorilla took a risk going in this direction, along with making the main character a woman, and I think they should be applauded for it. By now it's time to hit the hay and get some rest. Aloy heads for the Aspirin's Lodge where she's greeted by Resh, second only to Landra as the Nora's biggest asshole. You might have seen him back in the prologue following Landra like an obedient dog, and here he has some choice words for Aloy, who responds in kind. Find your bed, outcast, and dream of winning the proving. That's the closest you're gonna get. Oh, this is the bed house? With you standing guard? I figured it was the latrine. You're, you're very pregnant here! In the lodge we meet yet another familiar face. Bost! Remember him? Yeah, he's that kid. Remember when I said we were going to give him a chance to mature? Yeah, he didn't. In the lodge he begins mocking Aloy, continuing to do so even after he's told to shut it. Aloy, as is her way, rises to the challenge, and depending on your choice in the flashpoint, you even put Bost off a little bit. It's also in this lodge that you meet Vala, who despite being equally as competitive and sure of herself as the others, is quite friendly to Aloy, suggesting that they'll become fast friends when it's all said and done. But for now, it's time to get some sleep, with the biggest day of Aloy's life on the horizon. So what exactly is the Proving? Well, despite its grandiose buildup, it's fairly simple. It starts with the hunting section, where the aspirants must hunt machines and take a trophy from their kill. After that, they must navigate a course of winding paths, climbing walls, and rickety bridges, ending at an altar where they must present their trophy to the presiding proctor. The first to do so is declared the winner. Of course, Aloy's race is anything but simple. <laughs> Your trophy is shattered, outcast! Looks like you'll need another. Now far behind, she decides to take an older, more dangerous path, eventually catching up even to Bost and Vala, the two favorites to win. Jumping out ahead via slip wire, she places her trophy before the Proctor just before the others. Of course, Bost protests this, claiming she cheated, and for a split second, the Proctor looks ready to agree, until... Once outcast, and now brave, who is first among... <laughs> Well, shit. Just as things are starting to look up, the Proving comes under attack by a group of mysterious masked warriors, mercilessly mowing down the Proctor and other aspirants. Aloy and some others, including Bost and Vala, manage to take cover, with Aloy telling them to help the others while she takes on the attackers. This is our introduction to human-based combat, and as you can see, it isn't exactly the most exciting, but I'm going to be a bit of a contrarian compared to others and say that I don't mind it. Yes, it lacks depth and isn't nearly as exciting as fighting machines, but there's still satisfaction to be found in sniping enemies one after another, either from stealth or in combat, or in combining ranged and melee attacks in a dance-like rhythm. 
At first the attackers merely stay on the ridge, but eventually start sending in men to engage Aloy up close, forcing her to juggle fighting them while taking out more archers from above. Seeing that things aren't exactly going to plan, the leader of the attackers decides to pull out the big guns. Literally. In the ensuing onslaught, Vala is killed, followed shortly by Boss, leaving Aloy alone to fend for herself. Once she's taken care of the assholes and has a moment to breathe, she inspects their leader and makes a startling discovery that he, too, is wearing a focus. But before she can inspect it, she's rudely interrupted by this fella. As a way to apologize for this, he grabs her by her neck and prepares to kill her. Turn your face to the sun, child. Yeah, I know what you're probably thinking. Of course he'd be there to save the day. Him leaving and disappearing from Aloy's life was just a narrative setup for this fight to occur. You're right, of course, anyone could see it, but I think this scene is meant to be more than that. Even after telling her that he was leaving, abandoning her after raising her all her life, he was still close by, keeping a watchful eye on her. And, of course, seeing her life about to be snuffed out, he comes to her aid. And so far, so good, right? He's owning his own against a clearly capable fighter, perhaps even winning. <laughs> Okay, listen, I don't want to ruin what is an otherwise emotional scene, but this was predictable. How you feel about this scene will largely depend on how you feel about Rost. There's a bit of a debate amongst fans of the series regarding his place in the wider narrative. Based on my research, it would appear that the majority feel that he was a good yet flawed father figure who did the best he could given the circumstances, while the minority feel that he was a bit of a jerk who failed to show much love and affection. While I do certainly agree that he can come off as a bit of a jerk at times, I believe this is calculated. Remember what he said to Aloy just outside Mother's heart, just before he left. This attachment to me will only hold you back. It's my wish that you embrace the tribe. That there's the crux of it all. He didn't want Aloy to become attached to him. He's an outcast for life, where she has a chance to become one with the tribe, not left in isolation. This distance was a facade he maintained to help her along to this conclusion. Yet behind that facade, he did truly care about her, so much so that he willingly sacrifices himself to save her. It was at this end that he was finally able to lift this facade and embrace his true feelings, even if only for a moment. Following Aloy's tumble and Ross's sacrifice, we watch a scene where Aloy is being carried on a stretcher, flanked on either side by the high matriarchs. We don't know where she's being taken, only that Landra is far from happy to take her there, with Tears' rebuttal being that she's dying and should be close to her mother. This is intertwined with a nightmare she's having, featuring Ross, Landra, the man that killed Ross and nearly her, and some sort of machine tentacle thing. <laughs> When she awakes, she quickly realizes her focus has been removed from her head. She resolves to find it and get out of where she is, but since she's still more than a little banged up from her failed attempt to fly, she isn't going anywhere very quickly. She soon finds her clothes and focus, with which she discovers that she's inside Old Mother Mountain, much to her surprise since only high matriarchs are allowed inside. She eventually finds her bow, spear, and the focus she took off the commander of the Proving Attack, or Proving Massacre as it'll be called moving forward. Here we get her first major revelation, that the attack was meant for her and her alone, all the other deaths were collateral, eliminating witnesses. Attached with this order is a perfect image of Aloy, taken from when she first met Olin. Huh. Then appears another image, that of another woman, considerably older, yet shares a striking resemblance to her. Understandably, Aloy is more than a little confused. Who is this woman? What does she look like her, and why, for that reason, did the killers want her dead? Is she her mother? All these questions will have to wait a moment, for she's soon found by Tirsa, who quickly beckons her to follow. It was Tirsa's idea to bring Aloy to the mountain, for the Nora view it as sacred to die near one's mother. This prompts Aloy to ask if her mother is in the mountain, followed by describing her possible features. Tirsa says this is impossible because, well... You were not born of a woman, Aloy. The mountain is your mother. Yeah, a bit of an odd curveball. Entering the Great Chamber, we see a massive metal door on the far side, clearly a relic of the old ones, what the Nora called the Womb of the Mountain. 
As Tirsa tells that the High Matriarchs found Aloy lying in front of the door as a baby. Tirsa believed her to be a gift, whereas Lantern and others viewed her as a curse placed there by darker powers. Aloy, as she does, bluntly calls bullshit on both takes. But this isn't a goddess. Aloy! It's a door with people behind it. As she approaches it, something stirs in the door, and we hear a woman's computerized voice, the eponymous Old Mother. A red light scans Aloy and recognizes her as the mysterious woman she saw earlier. Unfortunately, something called the Alpha Registry is corrupted and Aloy's identity can't be confirmed, thus remaining shut. No, no. Tirsa sees this as a sign that it's Aloy's destiny to heal the corruption, so that Aloy may gain access to the mountain, tying it to her visions of the mysterious woman. When Aloy mentions that the killers came for her because of their resemblance, suggesting that they hold the key, Tirsa mentions that their power is too great, that they ambushed and slaughtered an Or war party while Aloy was unconscious. It's then that Aloy remembers that it was through Olin that the killers saw her, that he may have the answers. There's just one problem. Olin lives in Meridian, the capital of the Karja Sundom, well beyond the Sacred Lands. In keeping with their isolationism, any Nor who leaves the Sacred Lands are branded as exiles, never allowed to return. This of course doesn't bother Aloy, but Tirsa has another idea. Come, and we will make it so. Exiting the mountain, they're met by Jezza and Landra, where Tirsa gives them a brief summary of what happened inside, and that Aloy will have to journey beyond the Sacred Lands, all while Aloy awkwardly waits in silence behind her. With this in mind, Jezza concludes that to complete her task, Aloy must be named a Seeker, a Noral warrior anointed by the High Matriarchs in times of great need. Their purpose may include going beyond the borders of Nora territory, which means that they are given leave to come and go as they please. It also means that they can enter the ruins of the Metal World without fear of being made outcast, and can order other Nora to do their bidding, though I imagine there are restrictions to this. Now armed with the mark of a Seeker, Aloy is given leave to set out on her journey for answers, but not before she has to deal with Resh again. He's been named War Chief in absence of Sona, the actual War Chief, who disappeared following the War Party Massacre, an appointment that isn't popular with Old Nora. He shut the gate to Mother's Watch, the village directly below Old Mother Mountain, and thus Aloy has to ask him to open it. He refuses initially, then becomes furious when Aloy tells him that she's been anointed a Seeker. He eventually relents, even if only to get her from his sight. The sooner you're gone from here, the better. Before she can make her exit, however, we're introduced to a brand new machine, one that isn't quite like the others. It's called a Corruptor, and it's clear right from the get-go that it doesn't exactly come from the same machine family tree as the others. Also, as the name might suggest, it can take control of other machines, as it does here just outside Mother's Watch with a herd of striders, turning them on the Nora. <laughs> Upon breaking through, Aloy and the other Nora engage in a chaotic kerfuffle with the corrupted striders, all while the corruptor bounds around the village, throwing boulders and firing rockets at range, while swinging its lash-like tail in close combat, cementing its place on the list of my least favorite machines to fight, alongside every flying machine in the series. Once Aloy and the Nora defeat the Corruptor and Striders, she immediately begins to pick it apart and finds the component responsible for taking over the Striders. She attaches it to her spear, granting her the ability to override machines. Leaving Mother's Watch, she resolves to find a machine to test it on, with Teb pointing out that there just so happens to be a Strider herd nearby. Approaching the herd old Sneaky Beaky, Aloy manages to override one and use it as a mount, considerably speeding up travel time as she traverses the world. With her mechanical version of Roach, Aloy presses onto the gates of the Embrace, arriving just as a brave kills a corrupted Sawtooth. This is Varl, and though it isn't apparent right now, he'll eventually become one of the most important people in Aloy's life. He's the son of Sona, the war chief that's gone missing, as well as the older brother of Vala, the young woman Aloy spoke to in the Aspirant's Lodge, and who was among the dead in the Proving Massacre. I have a lot to say about Varl, including his relationship to Aloy and his place in the narrative throughout the series, but I'm going to save it for the Forbidden West video. For now, all I'm going to say is that, prior to Forbidden West, I really, really didn't like him. This was largely down to how I felt about his voice actor's performance, that it felt rather stunted and forced. My disposition towards him has changed, however, and now I kind of wish we got to see more of him in Zero Dawn. Thankfully, Forbidden West makes up for that. Varl? <laughs> in this conversation, Varl points Aloy in the direction of Mother's Crown and a woman named Maria about getting directions to Meridian. Just as Aloy is about to move on, he then asks her if she could look for Sona before heading for the west, reasoning that the tribe desperately needs her leadership in this time of crisis. Aloy promises to do what she can, and in doing so opens up a whole new quest chain that runs parallel to the main story, yet doesn't really cross over. We won't get into them right now, but needless to say, these quests, along with a later quest chain involving Erend, are main quests that feel like side quests. In the case of Sona's, this is fine, since they fit relatively well within the main narrative. Aaron's, not so much, but for now we'll pretend like we've gone straight to Mother's Crown. 
It's at Mother's Crown that Aloy meets Maria, who informs her that the Waste of Meridian is closed off, the car just shutting the gates to the fort guarding the pass out of fear of the corrupted machines infesting Noraland. This means that she'll have to clear a few corrupted zones to convince the car to let her pass. Once that's completed, Aloy presses onto the Karja Fort, known as Day Tower, which is under attack by a corruptor and a gaggle of enslaved machines. Once they're cleared, the grateful Karja fling open the gates, allowing her to enter, and marking the true start of Aloy's journey. Though it never says so directly, reaching Day Tower is, by all accounts, the start of Act 2. It's here the world fully opens up, Aloy having remained somewhat confined to the limits of Nord territory up to this point. It's also where we get our first full exposure to the Karja, the tribe that Aloy may have learned some about from Erend or Reverend Reed back in Mother's Heart. As you exit Day Tower and continue west, you'll see the world opening up to be quite literal. Though still rugged, the land is no longer hemmed in by towering mountain ranges, with many more open areas, broken up here and there by mesas, hills, and meandering rivers. From this vantage point, we get another glimpse of the game world's beauty on display, as well as the impressive draw distance, even as it's shrouded in a layer of handily placed fog. From Day Tower, it's a fairly straight shot to Meridian, though you'd be forgiven if you wanted to partake in some of the side activities that are set roughly along the path, including a tall neck and a bandit camp. Regardless of what direction you come from, the feeling you get when you lay your eyes on Meridian for the first time will be the same. Perched on a mesa, it dominates the skyline, immediately catching your eye and leaving you in wonder. I'll gush about Meridian later, but for now, let's continue on across the bridge into the main city. Just before the bridge, Aloy finds a crowd gathered, upset at having to wait to get into the city for some undisclosed reason, though if you listen closely, you'll learn it has something to do with Ursa. If you remember, she's Eren's sister and captain of the Vanguard. Upon reaching the main gate, she's stopped by a soldier, who informs her that due to a recent murder, all strangers must be searched before entering the city. It's not just any murder either, but that of Ursa, and Eren has taken her place as guard captain. Upon hearing this, Aloy requests that Eren be summoned. The man himself soon appears, overjoyed at her presence, having heard rumors that she had died. He quickly gives Aloy permission to come and go from a as she pleases, and the two step off to the side to speak in private. There, alone as you asked. And what did you want to tell me? Here, Aloy reveals that it was through Olin that she was targeted in the proving attacked, and that she needs to see him. Aaron doesn't believe this, of course, being a friend and all, but after some pushing from Aloy, he reveals that he left Meridian days ago, but that he has a house in the city. Aloy asks him to take her there, which he does, if not a little reluctantly. Aloy can also offer her condolences to Aaron about Ursa, which he ham-fistedly accepts. On the way to Olin's, we see that Aaron isn't taking his sudden promotion all too well. One more word, you scorched out slag, and I'll throw you in jail myself! Now get out of here, or I'll give you all a kick in the ass! This is exacerbated by his supposed heavy drinking, which we'll learn later was a problem even before his sister's death. Though he appears confident, the opposite couldn't be more true, which is something that will come up more than a few times throughout the series. Upon entering Olin's house using less than conventional means, Aloy begins investigating. She eventually finds a hidden hatch beneath a rug. After again using unconventional means to break through, we enter the vault, where Aloy begins to search for clues. It doesn't take long as she finds a journal which very clearly states that Olin was indeed behind her being targeted, his writing drenched with guilt, along with the name of the dig site he's currently gone to. We also find a rather grim message, revealing that the killers have taken his family hostage as a means of forced cooperation. Serve and they live. Disobey and I will open their throats and leave their corpses to prune in the sun. Aloy presents the evidence to Aaron, who's far from impressed by this revelation, but quickly jumps to asking Aloy how it is that she found it all out. Aloy quickly explains how the focus works, as well as how Olin's and the killer's focuses are different. She's then just about to leave when Aaron stops her and requests her help in finding Ursa's killers, hoping that Aloy's focus may reveal hidden clues as to how and where they are. Aloy refuses at first, but after some pushing from Aaron, she relents and agrees to help, the two agreeing to meet at the site of Ursa's murder. This is where the quest chain involving Aaron begins, the one similar to Sona's I mentioned earlier. Those that are main quests, but feel like side quests. Like Sona's, we'll come back to it later, but to put it briefly, Aaron's quest chain has a few problems, chiefly how it fits within the wider narrative, or rather, how it doesn't. Before we head off to find Olin, let's talk about Meridian for a bit. Save for a select few locations in other games, I don't think I've come across a more impressive urban set piece. Sure, there are larger locations with more to do and see, yet Meridian's design and style always makes me look forward to getting here. You have the main city atop the mesa, connected to the Palace of the Sun on another mesa next to it. 
You then have the village and maze lands below, connected to the largest city above by two massive elevators, feats of engineering in this world. There's also a wonderful amount of organic storytelling, one example being the old Sunring, once used for Jaron's sacrifices, now turned into a memorial for those killed during his reign, and not just for the Karja. Topping it all off are the impressive views you get of the wider world atop the Mesa, further solidifying the sense of Karjan dominion over the surrounding land, a sense further enhanced by the towering presence of the Spire, located on a neighboring Mesa known as the Alight. All that said, imagine my disappointment when we don't get to go back to Meridian and Forbidden West, at least not in the same capacity. There is still the possibility for DLC that'll do just that, however, so... Fingers crossed. Heading north from Meridian, Aloy eventually reaches the site marked in Olin's journal, only to find he's far from alone. Some of the killers are here as well, and just as she arrives, they raise a couple of corruptors from their ancient slumber, much to Olin's dismay. Just as things are looking dicey, Olin and the lead killer's focuses are disabled, and Aloy receives a mysterious call. Forgive this intrusion, Aloy. You left me no choice. <sighs> Who is this? An interested party. Now the focuses are disabled, but I don't know for how long. The rest is up to you. Who is this? From here you take care of the killers and the corruptors, getting some help from Olin should you be spotted. With them taken care of, it's time to interrogate Olin. I promise, I'll tell you everything. I know you will. We learn a lot from him here. For starters, the killers are known as the Eclipse, a call to the Shadow Karja and that they're led by Helis, the man who killed Rost and nearly killed Aloy. Confused yet? In short, the Shadow Karja are Jaron's loyalists who escaped the liberation, while Helis was Jaron's chosen champion. The Shadow Karja mantra is to overthrow Avad and retake Meridian, but where the Eclipse fit into this equation remains a mystery. We also learn about the Devil the Eclipse worship, an entity called Hades, who issued the kill order on Aloy when she first met Olin. It's through Hades that the Eclipse are raising ancient war machines, such as the Corruptors, but also larger machines they call Deathbringers. When it comes to the mysterious woman with whom Aloy shares a resemblance, all that we get is that Olin saw her image at a place called Maker's End, which also happens to be where he first ran into the Eclipse. Now we come to the moment of judgment. Though guilty of many things, the Proving Massacre above all, Olin's situation isn't nearly as cut and dry as it would first appear. As he tells it, the Eclipse merely showed up one day and forced his cooperation, with his family being taken hostage beforehand to make sure of it. He's an unwilling participant in their schemes, either unable or unwilling to make his escape for the sake of his family's safety. As Aloy puts it, Perhaps you're not an evil man, just a weak one. With that in mind, killing Olin seems heavy-handed, though I have to be fair and point out that he's more than accepting of this fate, only asking that Aloy rescue his family. I let Olin go, as I usually do, viewing him as an unwilling pawn in the Eclipse's schemes, now with a chance to atone and start anew, though I must stress I wouldn't blame you for killing him. Sparing him or not changes little in terms of the overall narrative, the only difference being if he's with you or not when you rescue his family. After that, they return to the claim, putting considerable distance between themselves and the Eclipse. With Olin dealt with, Aloy has a new heading, Maker's End. Along the way, she receives another call from the unknown man who called her earlier at the dig site, telling her that the mysterious woman's name is Elizabeth Sobek. Well, go on. What do you know about her? Stay on your present course, and before long, you'll know her as well as I do. Maybe better. Upon reaching Maker's End, she finds the outskirts crawling with Eclipse, the cult having a built-up presence in the ruins. After working her way through their dig sites, including facing off with yet another Corruptor, Aloy traverses a passage through some ruins, before jumping into an open area and coming face to face with the Deathbringer. Though this one is heavily damaged and immobile, it still packs a hefty punch, and at this early stage you'd be wise to remain in whatever cover is available, picking off its vents when they're exposed. There's also a few Eclipse troopers around, one of whom has a focus. Once you finish them and the Deathbringer off, Aloy will grab the focus and investigate its contents. It's then that we hear Hades for the first time. What? What is this? The Entity. Unacceptable. 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 Baffled and perhaps more than a little shocked by this, Aloy presses on into the tower. Inside we find a door, similar to the one in Old Mother Mountain, that immediately scans Aloy, recognizing her as the mysterious woman, Elizabeth Sobek. Unlike the mountain, however... 
Genetic profile confirmed. Entry authorized. Greetings, Dr. Sobak. Please step inside. Walking through the door, a computerized voice tells us that Aloy, as Elizabeth Sobek, is late, hundreds of years late, for a meeting with someone named Mr. Farrow. Climbing the tower, we come across a series of data points, both audio and text, which begins to tell a story of its own, with even the unknown caller providing data entries that give added context. We learn the tower and surrounding ruins belong to a old world corporation called Farrow Automated Solutions, or FAS, and that they made the focus, as well as the war machines we've already faced, which they sold to potential buyers as swarms. In one chamber, we even learn these machines' old world designations. Scare for the Corruptor, Kopesh for the Deathbringers, and Horus for the Enormous Metal Devil, who can also manufacture more themselves as well as the other machine types, and that they all consumed biomass as fuel. Now remember all that, because it's going to be important in a short bit. Manufacturing capabilities. They can make more of themselves. Then how would you ever stop them? As we climb the tower and listen to more data points, we start to get a sense of what might have happened. By all accounts, a swarm of feral machines began attacking other robots and human personnel of its assigned company. To make matters worse, they weren't responding to stand-down codes, and they couldn't be hacked because Ted Farrow, founder and CEO of FAS, specifically ordered that it not be possible. All the while, the swarm's numbers were growing at a rapid rate, sending the corporation spiraling into damage control. It's almost fitting that, as you ascend the tower, there's a rising sense of tension as the pieces begin to fit together, and perhaps form a grim conclusion. That conclusion is revealed when you reach the top floor. You scan a databank and use Aloy's alpha privileges to gain access to purge data, which reveals three holograms in sequential order. From these holograms, a grim truth is revealed. Elizabeth, good to, uh... It's been years. Where's your legal team, Ted? No need. I dropped all 18 lawsuits the moment you landed. I assume your data confirms this. All right, this promises to be interesting. Perhaps we could have lunch brought in. You know, get reacquainted. I know you, Ted. You've screwed something up, something big, or you wouldn't have eaten the crow necessary to get me here. So spit it out. There's a glitch in the chariot line. You're a killer robot? Peacekeepers, yes, those. So shut them down. <laughs> Obviously, Liz, we would, if we could. They're not responding. Are you telling me a swarm has gone rogue, Ted? It's worse than that. <sighs> Show me the data then. And I'll take that lunch. Alone. Ted Faro brought Elizabeth Sobek here. But they hated each other. Another has been recovered. This isn't a glitch. It's a catastrophe. Fully aware. It's bad. Bad? Jesus, Liz. It's not bad, Ted. It's apocalyptic. You built a line of killer robots. Peacekeepers. That consume biomass as fuel. In emergencies. And you made them capable of self-replication. Limited, self-manufacture, controlled. Not anymore. The glitch severed chain of command. The only nation this swarm answers to now is itself. What? You, you think I did? Everything else is just food. And at the rate it's replicating, Ted, it will strip the Earth bare in 15 months. We're not talking fall of civilization. We're talking extinction. I get it, Liz. So how do I stop it while it's contained? It's not contained! It can't be! You know what I mean! Right. Before the truth gets out, you mean. Liz, I will do anything you say. Keep working it, and whatever you recommend, I'll do. I'm gonna hold you to that, Ted. The Faro robots threatened all life on Earth. But somehow she defeated them. The world of the Old Ones fell, but life went on, or, or we wouldn't be here. A final fellow has been recovered. Project Zero Dawn. Jesus, Liz. There has to be another way. If there were a nicer way to fix your mess, I would have proposed it. But this? 
this? When I asked you to find a cure, I didn't expect it to be worse than the disease. It's not, Ted. It may be grim, but it's our only chance. Now sign the proposal. Sign it? I can't sign that. Yes, you can. That? Liz, I cannot in good conscience sign that. You've got a choice, Ted. I know. I am speaking to you from a VTOL en route to U.S. Robot Command. In 15 minutes, I meet with General Harris and the rest of the Joint Chiefs. What? Are you crazy? Now your choice is what I tell them. Sign, and I'll tell them the wealthiest corporation on Earth has guaranteed the funds necessary to build Zero Dawn. Exactly as I've designed it. Or don't sign, and I will make sure they and everyone else on this planet knows the real cause of the glitch. Jesus, Liz. You don't have to threaten me. I'll sign. Look on the bright side, Ted. From here on out, you get to do what you've always been good at. Footing the bill while others get their hands dirty. God forgive me. This scene, even after multiple playthroughs, still gives me anxiety. Even while rewatching this footage, I couldn't help but get this sinking feeling in my stomach, feeling the tension rise in the initial meeting, before hitting its peak as Elizabeth lays out the horrifying reality of the situation to Ted. Due to a glitch in the system, the robots had gone rogue, and they were destined to consume the world. Of course, this only leads to more questions. If the world was destined to be consumed, and all of humanity with it, how come it wasn't? The path to that answer is laid in the final hologram, with Elizabeth on her way to US Robot Command. It's also where we get our first mention of Project Zero Dawn, Elizabeth's solution, though by the sounds of it, it's far from a happy ending, leaving Ted Farrell to sulk and come to terms with what he created. I love this scene. I'll even go so far as to call it my favorite in the entire game. It works wonderfully as a great story beat, answering some questions while raising others, pushing the story along at a nice, even pace. I hope it becomes an example of great video game storytelling, one that will be studied for years to come. Now, with that gushing, let me ruin it all by being a nitpicking asshole and bring up the glitch. A glitch. Glitch. The glitch. As of the end of Horizon Forbidden West, we still don't know what caused it. Now I have to be fair here and refer back to what I said in the intro, that we're almost certainly going to get a third game, or at least some DLC for Forbidden West, which means the possibility that it'll be explained is still very open. That said, I will be quite disappointed if it isn't. Hell, it could be something as simple as a network failure due to some mundane update that severed the chain of command. Just ask Rogers Communications, they know all about that shit. Boring? Absolutely. But it'd be something. I did consider diving into the many theories about the glitch that I've come across online, but that would require so much added context that I ain't even gonna try. At least not for this video. I think we're all better off without it. Aloy is more than a little perplexed by what she's just learned, on top of being rather frustrated by the lack of concrete answers. It's here that the unknown caller chimes in. Was that your reaction to everything you've just learned? To whine like a spoiled child? <sighs> you should really try talking that way to me face to face. As you wish. Say hello to Silence, enigmatic explorer, utter pragmatist, voiced brilliantly by Lance Reddick, and one of the most important people Aloy will meet on her journey. I have a lot to say about him, but like Varl, we'll save that for the Forbidden West video. Much of the conversation with Silence is a recap of what we've learned, either from Olin or in the Tower, with Silence adding bits of his own knowledge. We can also ask him about himself and how it is that he can see through and listen to Aloy's focus, though he remains very bare bones in his explanations. You never get the sense that he's telling the whole truth, that he's holding quite a lot close to his chest, and he gets rather surly with Aloy's constant questioning. It's a trait that continues all the way through the series, often putting the two at loggerheads. From Silence, we learn the location of US Robot Command, the place where Elizabeth was heading to in the final hologram. Located due north of the Sacred Lands, it's become known to the Osram as the Grave Horde, a grim yet fitting name. As you ascend the slopes to it, you'll find it in the shadow of a Horus Titan, its metal tentacles slithering through the ruins. Upon entry, you'll find a handful of Eclipse inside, suggesting that they have a presence within. Once they're taken care of, you'll have a chance to listen to the data points scattered across the vicinity, accompanied by the corpses of their previous owners, giving the impression that they were their final words, even if they didn't know it at the time. Given that one of the horse's tentacles is driven right through the main entrance into the ruin, we can assume that they didn't die peacefully, to put it mildly. We also see for the first time the term Operation Enduring Victory, though its meaning is a mystery at this point. 
Descending into the ruins depths, we begin to explore, finding more data points, providing added context to the lives of the soldiers we found earlier, most being journal entries, with one exception being a soldier sending rather moving voice messages to his wife back home. Eventually, we'll come across more eclipses and corrupted machines, before entering some sort of meeting room, where a hologram of Earth displays just how rapidly the feral swarm was devouring the planet. Before that, you'll find a server room, where the soldiers' voice messages home are heavily edited, with any bits that might have been considered antithetical removed. We also find the response from his wife, starting upbeat, then devolving into a desperate plea for answers as she figures out that her husband's messages aren't entirely original. Leaving the meeting room, we come to a large open area and come face to face with the Horus. Eclipse troops are tampering with it somehow, and they manage to drop a Deathbringer down and reawaken it. Unlike the first one we faced back in Maker's End, this one's got full health and can move. On a brand new run, this can be one of the tougher fights in the game. The Deathbringer constantly tracking you and rarely taking a pause. Its rocket's able to destroy nearly any cover you try to use. On top of this are the Eclipse troopers that will relentlessly hunt you down, making the early stages of the fight a bit of a juggling act. From this fight, we traverse a string of corridors before reaching another meeting room and another hologram. It shows Elizabeth meeting with the Joint Chiefs just after she's laid out the plans for Project Zero Dawn. Whatever it is, the generals present, save for General Harris, are less than thrilled by what they've been told. In essence, mechanized warfare will not defeat the swarm due to its ability to hack anything robotic. As such, human combatants are necessary to fight back. This effort is codenamed Operation Enduring Victory, humanity's effort to hold off the swarm just long enough for Elizabeth and her team to finish Zero Dawn, which will be funded entirely by Ted Farrow. The generals protest, but as chairman, General Harris has final say and has already secured an orbital launch base as a staging area for Zero Dawn, to which Elizabeth immediately heads to after the meeting. With this information, we head back outside, Aloy already set on finding the orbital launch base. Sounds, of course, has already found the location. Great. Only one problem. It resides directly under the palace at Sunfall, seat of the Shadow Karja, who the Eclipse, if you remember, are an offshoot of, with many of its members holding positions of authority within Shadow Karja ranks, all of them wearing focuses, too many for science to take down at once, as they're all connected together via a vast network. It's then that Aloy suggests that they crash the network, which sparks an idea in Silent's head, with him conveniently remembering that there's a weak point in the network. He sends Aloy the location, adding that he'll be in touch when she arrives, before disappearing, leaving us and Aloy to continue wondering just what Zero Dawn is. What was Zero Dawn? What sort of super weapon did Elizabeth make? She stopped the machines, but not before the world she knew her civilization ended. Let's hope it won't come to that again. Before we meet up with Silence again, let's talk about side quests for a bit. In all open worlds, and RPGs in general, good and great side quests further enhance the experience, both in terms of world building and narrative, building on previous established themes, concepts, lore, or just off the main story itself. While this was common knowledge even before then, it was given a much higher standard with the release of The Witcher 3, a game that continues to be lauded for how its side quests are written and presented. This higher standard is felt across the Horizon series, though there is a marked improvement between Zero Dawn and Forbidden West. Given that it was Guerrilla's first crack at the open world genre, Zero Dawn's side quests are little hit and miss in terms of quality, but they all share the same core trait, that each of them has a story. Side quests are broken up into two categories, side quests and errand quests. Errand quests are exactly what you might expect. Pick up this, deliver it here, or something along those lines. Very basic, very mundane, not much to talk about. That said, they still have that core trait, building on at least one of those four facets I just mentioned. Hey. Great. People finally stopped calling me outcast and now it's savage. This largely comes in the form of some justification, usually tied to events that have already transpired or are currently transpiring in the main narrative. Their mundaneness remains, but the storytelling gives them a complexity that makes them at least somewhat interesting. Side quests, however, are a different machine, and it's here that we get much more variance. Now, when I say variance, I don't necessarily mean quality, though some of you may see it that way, and that's fine, not every side quest is going to click in the same way. This variance is mostly shown in the presentation. A perfect example can be found in the Hunter's Lodge questline, where you first meet Talana and help her become Sunhawk, the leader of the Lodge, all while hunting a menacing Thunderjaw known as Redmaw. 
The majority of the quests merely involve hunting dangerous machines, yet there's a considerable amount of storytelling as well, with Talana's backstory, how it ties to the Red Raids, and the reign of the Mad Sun King, and how Assis, the main antagonist in this quest chain, only became Sunhawk because Talana's father sacrificed himself to save others in the Sunring, along with her brother, with this story even having an alternate source in the form of Legan, the oldest member of the Lodge who, unlike Talana, witnessed the event firsthand. Another can be found when you first come to Sunfall and meet Vanasha, a Karja spy who tasks you with rescuing Uthid, a Shadow Karja general who's on the run after exposing the culling of Sunfall's population by High Priest Bahavas, who Uthid ends up killing. This opens the door for Vanasha to get Dowager Queen Nasadi and Prince Edamin, who the Shadow Karja have propped up as the one true Sun King, out of Sunfall. After an extended clash with the Eclipse and corrupted machines, you get the royals across Lake Daybring to the town of Bright Market, where you're greeted by Sun King Avad in what could be your first canonical meeting with him if you haven't done Eren's quest chain yet or progressed far enough. I hope you're beginning to understand what I'm getting at here. Though they're only side quests, the attention to detail with regards to their narrative elements brings them up to that higher standard and makes them infinitely more interesting while further enriching your knowledge of the game's world, events, characters, themes. You get the idea. Was, was holding his own. Since I brought one of them up only a moment ago, I think it's time we talk about Sona and Eren's respective quest chains. These are, for what must be the third or fourth time I've said this now, main quests that feel like side quests. This isn't a criticism of their quality, they're definitely on par with what you come across throughout the main story, but it's more with how they fit within that main narrative. You pick up Sona's when you first meet Varl as you leave the Embrace, way back earlier in the game. It involves finding Sona, helping her take down an Eclipse dig site, then removing the Eclipse presence in the Sacred Lands for good by destroying their main base of operations in the Ring of Metal, located in the Ruins of Devil's Grief. It also serves as payback for the Proving Massacre and War Party Ambush, as well as providing us with a little insight into the strained relationship between Varl and Sona, no doubt further strained by Vala's death. Remember, Sona is Varl and Vala's mother. Sona's questline fits well within the main narrative, largely due to its location. The search for Sona begins in an area well before Mother's Crown, while the quest to defeat the Eclipse in the Ring of Metal takes place in a region that you'll pass through at least a couple times, coming to and from the Grave Horde, never truly taking you off the main path. It just melds with the main story so much more nicely. In fact, the only reason I can really give for saying that they feel like side quests is because it's a pretty short questline, probably even shorter than the side quests involving Vanasha, and also because it's not that narratively complex. Eren's questline is where things get a little tricky. It too is fairly short, though considerably longer than Sona's, and considerably more complex. Beginning right after you search Olin's vault for clues, you meet Eren at the site of Ursa's murder. Scan the area with her focus, Aloy realizes that a few things are off with the ambush site. See? Car tracks. I think someone moved the bodies here, then scattered them across the field. Following the car tracks, you come upon an old world ruin, where you're greeted by some Osram, not Shadow Karja, who Eren and others originally believed was behind Ursa's murder. After an extended battle with the Osram and a couple of Ravagers, Aloy searches the ruins and discovers that Ursa and her vanguard were murdered there, without a fight, then brought to the other site, staged as an ambush. But why? Upon further investigation, we find a bloody rock and cut leather straps, suggesting perhaps that the murderers mutilated someone, swapped on with Ursa, posing them as her. Which means... Then, then my sister could be alive. I, I, I'm going. Meet me back there when you can. Returning to Meridian, in a meeting with Aaron, Avad, and Blameless Murad, a character who I think doesn't get nearly enough screen time, it's confirmed that the body recovered isn't Ursus, meaning that there's a chance she could still be alive, with Avad vowing to see her found. It's here Murad puts out a suggestion as to who might be behind her possible kidnapping. A man named Durval, a genius Osram tinker with a deep-seated hatred for the Karja, born out of his family's murder at the hands of the Mad Sun King. He had previously worked with Aaron, Ursa, and Avad towards liberating Meridian, but when he vowed to slaughter its inhabitants and burn the city to the ground, he was pushed out. His hatred has also extended to Ursa and Avad specifically, because he fancied her, but she spurned him for Avad. Along with possibly being the only person capable of such a ruse, it makes him the perfect suspect. Our search takes us to Pitchcliff, a small Osram settlement on the border with the Sundom, where Murad has an agent. Unfortunately, the agent is killed, but not before drawing a map in his own blood. Following the map, we come upon a sizable outpost, garrisoned by Osram with captured machines held down in chains. Clearing out the camp, we enter into some sort of creepy workshop dungeon thing and find Ursa alive, being tortured by some sonic device. Ursa! Welcome 
After disabling the device, Aaron takes Ursa in his arms, lamenting how he wasn't there for her, which Ursa counters by saying that she knew it was a trap and was hoping to take out Durval then and there. She warns him and Aloy that Durval has plans for Avad and Meridian before finally succumbing to her wounds. Leaving Aaron to grieve, Aloy searches the workshop and finds a manifest for tons of blaze being shipped to Meridian, bought under what can be presumed to be an assumed identity. With this in hand, Aloy returns to Meridian while Aaron stays behind to take care of Ursa's body. Back in Meridian, we meet up with the gang in the palace. Giving him the name on the manifest, Murad states that there's a house under that name in the city, and that Derval may very well be there. Of course, he isn't there when we arrive, but we find a bomb hooked up to lots and lots of blaze. After pushing the blaze out a window, causing an explosion that's never brought up again, job done, right? Not quite, because as Aloy mentions, This is never. Derval said he'd make a bomb watch. Aaron and his men head back to the palace, while Aloy follows a trail of blaze to another house, where we discover that Durval found a secret way into the palace. Chasing after him, we finally get to confront him. Oh, you must be the Nora who bushwhacked my camp. The fight happens in two stages, starting with Durval and his goons, before a beaten Durval calls in some glinthawks with a lure. Taking care of those, we get to see Aaron knock out the still divine Durval as a pleased Avad looks on. I'm sorry for going into so much detail compared to Sona's quest, but by comparison, the complexity of Eren's quest requires such detail to make sense, which isn't criticism, it's what I enjoy the most about them. So why do they feel like side quests and not main? In Eren's case, they just don't fit into the main story, both narratively and in terms of progression. Searching for clues with Eren does fit, for it's conveniently on the way to Maker's End after you interrogate Olin, and returning to Meridian while on the way to the Grave Horde isn't that ridiculous of a notion. But heading to Pitchcliff, located in a region you might not visit otherwise, then back to Meridian? Yes, you do so after Ursa's warning, but you get the idea, right? It just doesn't seem to mesh well with the rest of the main story. As side quests, this can be fine, but as main, more than a little disjointed in my books. So after all that rambling, why are Sona and Eren's quests labeled as main quests? For one very simple reason. In the end game, you'll be supported by allies and friends you've made across the game's side quests. Help them, they help you. Don't help them, they don't show up. A simple formula, yet one that works and makes sense. Erend, Varl, and Sona are there regardless. Erend and Varl even show up during one of the final cutscenes, and I suspect that Gorilla's writers needed a justification for them being there, to give their presence some narrative weight. How better to do that than to make you interact with them in the story, even if those interactions are really sidebars to the main story and might not fit all that well. Thankfully, this is something Gorilla's writers will avoid in Forbidden West. Returning to the main story, after speaking with Silence outside the Grave Horde, we follow his directions to a point in the far southwest corner of the map, deep in the jungles of the Jewel. At the top of a cliff, we find a campfire, where Silence instructs Aloy to wait for nightfall. How nice of you to finally drop by. It's then that Silence drops a bit of a shocker on us, stating that to disrupt the Eclipse's focus network, Aloy must infiltrate their main base via a back way in. The network is centered on a module that's been installed on a derelict tall neck. Destroy that, down goes the network. Given how much he knows about the place, Aloy quickly puts two and two together and suggests that Silence was once part of the Eclipse. Silence denies this of course, but does admit to assisting them, before realizing how dangerous they were becoming. Aloy doesn't buy this of course, but Silence disappears before she can bombard him with questions, leaving her no choice but to push on. Coming out the other side of the crevice, we find that the back way in doesn't mean the easy way, with it consisting of two open areas crawling with corrupted machines. Thankfully, due to their assigned paths, the machines can either be easily avoided or taken down with stealth. Eventually, they'll come to a ridge over which should be the tall neck, except... You getting this? I see the legs of a tall neck down there, but no tall neck. Damn. The transmitter's been moved. Check down the ravine to the left. Only place it could be. So much for your insider knowledge. Because that would have been too easy, right? Following Simon's instructions, we head further down the ravine, eliminating Cliff's troops as we head round to a crossing point as the path along the ravine is blocked off. Just before the crossing, we come upon a large tent, in which there are several data points and a set of conspicuously placed armor. This armor. There's only one man big enough to wear this. Helis. I have some things to say about Helis a little later, but for now all I'll say is that I strongly recommend you give all the data points a listen. After crossing a makeshift bridge, we follow the ravine, with the tall neck quickly coming into view, as well as getting closer to the sounds of explosions which we've been hearing since we entered the camp. 
Nearing the tall neck, Aloy senses something clearly isn't right. Bitter. I don't like this. It feels wrong. Everything here is raw. Just get to the module and destroy it. Reaching the top of the tall neck reveals what that something is. Hades is here, housed in a horus connected directly to the tall neck, leaving Aloy more than a little shaken. When she attempts to gain access to the module and fails, Hades swings by to investigate. Entity has come here. Entity miscalculated. Entity cannot destroy me. I am beyond its reach. Maybe you are. But this isn't! Destroy the entity! Falls is a sort of chase slash platforming sequence, clambering across the ravine's cliffs and handholds, all while under intense fire from multiple deathbringers. Once you've escaped them, you run into more cliffs than you can shake a stick at, dodging their attacks and killing any who stand in your way, despite what Silence says. You then reach the rappel point Silence pointed out earlier as your means of escape. going, but you survived. After yet another failed attempt to fly, Aloy is less than impressed with Silence, given that he knew Hades would be there. To his credit, Silence does recognize that he took a risk sending her there, reasoning that it was the only way and, given that she succeeded, they now have access to Zero Dawn and its secrets. Of course, this does little to calm Aloy, who's more than a little done with his secrets. To that, Silence says this. Good. That means you're wising up. Trust is for fools. It shifts and crumbles like sand, a poor foundation for any partnership, but mutual self-interest. Now that is a solid bedrock upon which you and I might build a new science of understanding. We both need answers, Aloy, and thanks to you, we're on the verge of grasping them. It's unfold. We'll speak again. You miserable... Now it's time to head to Sunfall and Zero Dawn. Sunfall is the most westerly settlement in the game and the makeshift capital of the Shadow Karja. Upon arrival, Silence gives us an impromptu history lesson. Sunfall, the Mad King Drawn Summer Palace, a bulwark of Karja might against the howling Forbidden West. Thanks for the history lesson. Entering Sunfall is like entering another world. Though still technically Karja, those who live here do so under crushing conditions, a stark contrast to the more affluent lives of those in Meridian. Shadowside, the first area of Sunfall you enter, makes this abundantly clear. A tent city outside the walls, it's home to the poorest of the Shadow Karja, servants and slaves dragged with the nobles and priests who fled Meridian during the liberation. Disease, hunger, and thirst pervade here, the only means of escape being to either flee Sunfall altogether and risk the wilds, or join the ranks of the Kestrels, the Mad Sun King's former elite soldiery, now the bulk of the Shadow Karja army, led personally by Helis. Entering the fortress proper is where we'll find the market, though calling it a market is a bit of a stretch given that Sunfall has been cut off from all outside trade since the liberation. Further up we get a grandstand view of the Sunring. Unlike the Sunring in Meridian, this one is still very much due for sacrifices, though judging by our introduction, it's also being used to train Kestrels against the toughest machines, Behemoths in particular. The difference with the Sun Karja can also be seen in the residents of the fortress, who wear far darker clothing in comparison, further embodying the Shadow aesthetic. After that comes the Citadel, the seat of Shadow Karja Authority, where Prince Edaman and his mother Queen Nasadi reside, though as we see upon entering the throne room, they do so more as prisoners than as true monarchs. 
This is largely due to Edaman being the youngest son of Duran, and with the Shadow Karja calling Avada false sun king, Edaman is their only source of legitimacy. Entering the throne room for the first time also introduces us to Vinasha, opening the way to her side quest mentioned earlier, as well as Lucent Bahavas, who serves as religious leader of both the Shadow Karja and, as we'll learn later, the Eclipse, sharing overall leadership of both with Helis. Silence directs us to the grand balcony behind the throne room, where there's a convenient opening in the balustrade to another one below. After a quick climbing section, we come to a vent, conspicuously covered up, which Aloy immediately recognizes as signs of Silence's previous visits. It's here that Silence tells us that, I've shown you the way in, but this humble vent marks a point of no return. Which is weird, because it isn't. Not really. Entering the vent does put us on a sort of rails for a while, but we are eventually free to explore once again after that. So either this bit of dialogue was written purely for narrative reasons, or entering the vent was meant to be a point of no return at some point during development. As she does, Aloy has the perfect response. You'll tolerate what I give you, Silence. I didn't ask you along for the ride. As we enter the bunker, Silence begins waffling on about his long search for answers while Aloy seems to blissfully ignore him, as would anyone I would think. Approaching the door, we go through the same song and dance as before, hold for our dentist can, with everything going accordingly until... Entry authorized. Malfunction. 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 Are you kidding me? You don't hear me laughing. Shut up. There's gotta be another way. Thanks to a thousand years of lying dormant, there's been a mechanical failure. More than a little flustered, a desperate Aloy invokes Elizabeth's name to access the door's root commands, ordering an emergency venting to circumvent the issue. This works to great effect, except that the venting is directed outside. Whoops, that got their attention. Despite this, we have no choice but to press on. Passing through the door, we receive a rather ghostly welcome. Welcome to Project Zero Dawn. These first two runes don't reveal much in their data points, but they do begin to paint a grim picture, such as one suggesting they need to soundproof the waiting room so as to muffle the cries and shrieks of horror coming from the next room. It's in that next room, a holographic theater, that we learn the first truth about Zero Dawn, that it isn't a super weapon designed to save humanity, but a hope and a prayer that something might come after. Operation Enduring Victory isn't a fight for survival, but a fight to give the Zero Dawn team time to make that hope a reality. That said, humanity, no matter what, is doomed to go extinct. That last point alone, in my opinion, is what puts Zero Dawn head and shoulders above most post-apocalyptic fiction. In fact, I go so far to call it the most compelling aspect of the entire Horizon series, on top of Aloy's character arc. In other post-apocalyptic works, we almost always see the usual trope of human civilization collapsing after a great cataclysm. This isn't criticism, Zero Dawn makes full, unashamed use of it, but humanity going extinct? Entirely? To my knowledge, I don't think any other post-apocalyptic fiction in the last 20 years or so has used such a concept. I personally think it's brilliant, as is the timing of it, because it recontextualizes many of the lingering questions we will have had going into this scene. Case in point, instead of wondering how it is that human civilization collapsed, now we're wondering how it is that humanity even came back to begin with. It's thought-provoking, and I love it. Beyond the theater, we encounter a group of kestrels, repelling in from above. After taking care of the featherheads, we have a moment to listen to the many audio data points scattered throughout the chamber. These are interviews with some of the candidates chosen by Elizabeth to work on Zero Dawn, drawn from a vast array of backgrounds, including a hacker, a biologist, a military officer, and an art historian. In them, we hear their confusion, fear, anger, and despondency. Probably the saddest among them is that of Brad Andak, an engineer who worked on the feral robot's self-replication subroutines. God, there were no limits. I hope by now you're beginning to see how Zero Dawn's data points work as lore dumps. Whereas lore dumps in other games, be they journals, books, or the like, may or may not tie to the location that they're found in, data points in Zero Dawn are almost always relevant to their given setting, further enriching and expanding on the world. This is further improved by the developers actually taking the time to meticulously organize these data points by their specific relevance, doing so by main quest, side quest, and data points that you can find while exploring the open world, and then breaking them down again by their type, text, audio, or hologram. Making them actually relevant to their given location not only makes them more interesting, but can actually help with player immersion, adding narrative weight to their discovery and absorption. Interestingly, the majority of data points found on main quests are audio and holograms, which I think was a wise decision as some players might not be bothered to read everything, especially at this late stage in the story. In the next room is another holographic theater, where we finally learn what Zero Dawn really is. In essence, it's a super intelligent, fully automated terraforming system run by what Elizabeth calls a true AI, named Gaia, supported by nine subordinate functions, each designed to fulfill a certain task pertaining to said terraforming system. 
Among these functions is Hades, which immediately conjures a multitude of questions. Just how did Hades end up in that Horus Titan? Why does it want Aloy dead? Matter of fact, just what is Hades' role in the system? We also learn of Apollo, an immense repository of human knowledge that the new generation of humans spawned by Eleuthia was supposed to learn from, but considering the state of the world, that clearly never happened. Why? The following room is full of more audio data points, subsequent interviews with those we heard prior to Elizabeth's message, making their decision on whether or not they want in on Zero Dawn. Most accept, though not all, either asking to be euthanized or be indefinitely detained throughout the project's duration, with anyone who chooses these two options granted 48 hours to reconsider. Listening to the data points, you get the sense that most of them don't fully understand or even believe that Zero Dawn is going to work, but opt in simply because the thought of there literally being nothing after the fall is far worse than not trying. After a couple more skirmishes with Eclipse soldiers, we start to tour some of the labs of some of the subordinate functions. Hephaestus, responsible for designing and constructing the machines we find out in the world, doing so in the cauldrons that you may have explored in the open world. Apollo, responsible for archiving and disseminating 42 zetabytes of collective human knowledge in four different languages, no less. Aluthia, responsible for the preservation of the human genome, as well as gestating and raising the first generation of humans at cradle facilities around the world. And Hades, an extinction failsafe, reversing terraforming operations in case Gaia doesn't get it right the first, or second, or even third time. Of course this conjures many questions, especially with regards to Hades and Hephaestus. The questions around Hades haven't changed, though knowing its original purpose has given them new context. What we learn of Hephaestus asks only one question, but an important one. If Gaia was designed to preserve life, then why are the machines attacking people? What caused the derangement? We begin our final approach to Elizabeth's office, which has just been out of our reach throughout the latter half of our exploration. Coming just after Eleuthia, Aloy wonders if Old Mother Mountain was one of the cradle facilities its Alpha mentioned. If you remember, it's in front of its hatch that Tirsa said Aloy was found as a baby. We're also reminded that it wouldn't open for her earlier because of a corrupted Alpha registry. After mentioning this to Silence, Aloy realizes that there could be a copy in Elizabeth's office, meaning that she might be able to finally fix the corruption and get inside, further raising the stakes. Elizabeth's office is less an office and more of a full-size lab. Here we find three holograms, each dated at varying stages of Gaia's development, starting with Gaia showing the first signs of true human emotion, just as Elizabeth envisioned, followed by Ted Farrow in a scene soaked in so much irony you could wring it out with a towel, pushing Elizabeth to give Gaia a kill switch just in case it runs amok, with even Gaia agreeing with this course. Now remember this, because it's going to be important later. The last hologram is from just as they're preparing to move to a place called Gaia Prime, with Elizabeth clearly in distress, what with the Pharaoh Swarm closing in. When asked by Gaia, Elizabeth openly admits to being afraid that they might fail, though Gaia is quick to dispel this fear. Elizabeth, extinction was inevitable. Thanks to you, life will have a future. You really believe that? I believe in you, Elizabeth. In you, all things. Entering Elizabeth's actual office, we find a few more data points, including one about the Odyssey, another attempt to save humanity, albeit on another planet several light years away, organized by a group called Far Zenith. Huh. Unfortunately, according to Far Zenith, it blew up before it left our solar system, meaning that Zero Dawn is now the only hope for earthly life. The data points, though, are secondary to our main objective, the Alpha Registry. Copying the file to her focus, Aloy and Silence have a quick exchange, where he calls her naive for thinking she'll find anyone behind the hatch at Old Mother Mountain bluntly calling her a creation of a machine. Aloy is rather vexed by this, but before she can do or say anything about it, more Eclipse soldiers repel in from above. When Aloy comes to, we find her in a less than ideal spot, caged above Sunfall's Sunring, weapons and focus just out of reach. As she tries to grab them, we listen to Helis as he approaches along a bridge, waffling on about his given destiny as chosen, wondering how it was that Aloy survived the Proving Massacre, and thus was allowed to interfere with the Eclipse's plan, attacking dig sites and killing his men. Like the religious fanatic he is, he eventually reasons that it was all predestined by the sun, so that she might fall into his hands, so that she could be sacrificed in the ring below. Even after multiple playthroughs, I'm still not sure how I feel about Helis. 
On the one hand, he comes off as a fairly one-note villain with little in the way of depth beyond his religious fanaticism, and yet listening to the data points found in his hovel at the Eclipse's main base suggests otherwise. He had a loving wife, whom he too loved dearly, who then died while giving birth, ending their unborn child's life in the process, and as such was left with great sorrow, as would anyone in such circumstances. This sorrow then morphed into his fanaticism when Jaron had them buried in the Alight, an honor usually reserved for sun kings and honored heroes, further cementing his loyalty. These data points are still drenched in the religious fanaticism we see in-game, but they paint Helis in a far more interesting light. If they're meant to make us just a little sympathetic for him, then I think they fail in that regard, but they do make me wonder about something. Was he always so fanatical? I have no doubts that he was always a bit of a nut job, but I can't help but wonder if Jaron honoring his wife and child was the tipping point that sent Helis into full religious zealot, unbending in his loyalty to Jaron and his beliefs. It's an interesting thought, and yet when we finally get to speak with him at length at Sunfall, he returns to that one-note state of being, just waffling on about his destiny and his skill at slaughter. This sort of half-and-half -half state is mostly okay, if only for the simple fact that he's not the main antagonist. In fact, Aloy and Silence each make a remark at one point that I think is meant to highlight his bloody simplicity, but I can't be sure. I just think it's a bit disappointing, because for as compelling of a villain Hades is, I think it was a missed opportunity to make Helis more than what we got. Towards the end of the conversation, Helis tells Aloy that he ordered Eclipse forces to invade the Norse sacred lands following her crashing of the Focus Network, and to exterminate the tribe wholesale. He then crushes Aloy's focus, which for some reason makes him get all... Uh, excited, we'll say. <sighs> Before turning and leaving. A lengthy cutscene follows where Helis again waffles on, this time to the crowd gathered in the Sunring. Our time in shadow is over, raw, while a couple of corruptors take control of the behemoth. Aloy is then, without her weapons or armor, dropped into the arena. This fight takes place over two stages, the first stage being to get your gear back, using the behemoth's size and strength to destroy two pillars holding up the race platform, dropping your gear and weapons with it. The second stage is of course actually fighting the behemoth, though with the handicap of not having to focus to pinpoint weak spots, though if you fought behemoths before, then you'll already know where they are. After you kill the behemoth, a stunned Helis sends the corruptors down to finish the job, to which Aloy has a great response. Why leave it to them? Come get me yourself! Just as the Corruptors close in, the gate into the Sunring explodes and Silence comes bursting in on a Strider, a second one in tow. Three overridden Ravagers follow after him and quickly maul the Corruptors, while Helis calls him Traitor, something that Aloy picks up on as she and Silence make their escape. After creating some distance with Sunfall, we finally get to speak with Silence face to face. He gives Aloy a new focus, having copied every piece of data she scanned, including the Alpha Registry. Happy birthday, Isaac. Daddy sure does love his little big man. You're really good at making it impossible to like you, Silence. But I guess I need this. Before he dips, we can question him if we like, including on how it is that Helis knows him. As far as we know, Silence only assists the Eclipse, not know Helis personally. On this subject, Silence is evasive, though it's clear he knows more than he's letting on. Just before parting ways, Aloy asks Silence to come and help the Nora, but he flatly refuses, only saying that he has other plans. Then, in a rare moment of empathy, he apologizes for the comments he made in Zero Dawn, in hopes that Aloy finds what she's looking for, before speeding off into the sunset, leaving Aloy to go and help the Nora on her own. So now you're probably thinking that she'll be sent straight to the Sacred Lands to save the Nora. After all, Helis made it pretty clear that you'd accept nothing less than total annihilation, so given the urgency, you'd expect that you'd have no other option but to go and save the day. Except you aren't. Not really. You can absolutely head straight there, of course, and I'd imagine most players would, but you're also more than able to go do literally anything else in the game and blissfully ignore the fact that the Nora are on the verge of being genocided. As nitpicky as it may seem, this is arguably the biggest stumble in the story in terms of pacing and player agency. We don't know if Aloy's mother, whoever she is, is in any real danger, and thus there's no massive panic or rush to go and find the answers, which allows us the freedom to explore, thus preserving the story's continuity. To put it mildly, however, saving an entire tribe from being wiped out is pretty damn urgent, so the fact that the game allows you to simply ignore it without any consequences does put a big question mark on player agency. I have to be fair and again point out that I severely doubt most players will take this route. I mean, Aloy seems pretty dead set on heading straight to the Sacred Lands, so why shouldn't you? It's a glaring stumble to be sure, but given how well the rest of the story balances player freedom versus player agency on what is once again Gorilla's first attempt at an open world, it's a forgivable one, at least this time around. But back to the task at hand. Fitted with a new focus and armed with the Alpha Registry, it's time for Aloy to go and save the Nora, then finally learn the secrets of Old Mother Mountain, and that of her origins. At the gates of the Embrace, we arrive to find the worst possible scenario unfolding. The Eclipse have broken through. 
The whole of the Embrace is shrouded in wood smoke, crawling with Eclipse soldiers and corrupted machines, while the corpses of both Nora and Eclipse litter the paths and roads. The skies are heavy with rain clouds and it begins to pour as you hurry to Mother's heart. This works at setting the scene due in large part to the fact that you can't fast travel into the Embrace. In fact, the closest you can get is the main gate, the same one where you first met Varl earlier in the story. It forces you to traverse the Embrace and bear witness to the devastation the Eclipse has wrought on the land, further heightening the sense of urgency you may already be experiencing. Arriving at Mother's Heart, you're immediately engaged by two Corruptors and some Eclipse soldiers. Once you've dealt with them, you head up the path to the mountain. Upon reaching the top, you find a corrupted Thunderjaw firing disc rockets at the entrance into the mountain, suggesting that any survivors have holed up in there. Once you attack the Thunderjaw, Sona and Varl lead whatever brave survived out of the mountain to assist, leading to a chaotic battle as more Eclipse soldiers arrive. Once the Thunder Jaw is down, all that's left is to mop up the remaining Eclipse before we're finally given a chance to breathe. Before heading inside, we speak with Varl, where we learn Tirsa ordered the tribe to take refuge in the mountain, despite tribal law forbidding such an action. Most of the tribe's non-combatants survived, but the Braves took grievous losses, with most of those who survived being wounded, including Varl. This, along with the Proving Massacre and War Party ambush, has put the tribe in a precarious position, and yet through it all, they have survived. Inside the mountain is a rather somber sight, with Nora scattered around the cave trying to come to grips with their situation. It's here you can speak with some of whom you've met on your travels, namely in side quests, but also along the main story, including a wounded but alive Teb and a grumbly Resh. We find the High Matriarch standing directly in front of the hatch, with Tirsa and Jezza happy to see her, while Landra continues to be an insufferable asshole. Aloy informs them that she should be able to get through the hatch this time, to speak to Old Mother, which of course rankles Landra, who outright blames Aloy for everything that has just transpired, despite what Sona said only moments earlier. Outside, she brought low a corrupted Thunderjaw. She lifted the siege. Aloy can either respond or ignore this, but either way, she steps past the High Matriarchs, leaving them to bicker amongst themselves. Approaching the hatch, Aloy goes through the same song and dance as last time, her entry initially denied before she restores the Alpha Registry, prompting the hatch to finally open for her. As the Nora look on, Aloy takes a moment to compose herself before heading inside. Upon entry, we're welcomed to Eleuthia Cradle 9, confirming that the mountain was indeed a cradle facility, the birthplace of the Nora people. Silence also contacts us, and we begin our investigation. I see you're inside. Figured I might be hearing from you. Shall we begin? I never stopped. Upon entering the main portion of the facility, we're immediately met by a wall painting similar to a child's artwork, chaotic in its near alien imagery. There are several of these wall paintings in this facility, and I have to admit that I find them rather disturbing, their primitive nature juxtaposed against the advanced tech all around, suggesting that things didn't quite go to plan. Along our paths are several offshooting sections, in order of human development, starting with the ectogenic chambers that birthed the first generation of new humans, with the very chamber that birthed Aloy ominously standing all on its own. The following sections are where this new generation was raised in their early years, from toddlers all the way to adolescents, by robot caretakers called multi-servitors. It's from the remains of these multi-servitors that we find a series of holograms, giving us an insight into the relationship between the robots and the facility's progeny, including the moment when the new humans were first released into the world. This hologram can be quite sobering, seeing these new humans grapple with the thought of finally being released into the world they wished so long to see, but now having second thoughts, especially when they're told they won't be able to return. Towards the end of the hall, you come to a door. Like much of the facility up to this point, it too is painted over, but this one's been done with a noticeable anger and hatred slashed with red. This door leads into the larger chamber in the center of the facility, in plain view from above. It's also locked. In the last hologram you come across, some of the children tried to break in, but were beaten back by the multi-servitors. As such, they grew to hate the door, denying them all that space, keeping them locked away in the cramped confines, the inner chamber seemingly taunting them. Aloy, of course, has no issue getting through. Upon stepping through, we learn that this central chamber was, in fact, supposed to be where the new humans were to learn from Apollo and its repository of human knowledge. However, due to the locked door, the new humans never got to learn from it, or gain access to the trove of focuses that happened to be there. This leads us to asking why that is, a question only deepened when we learn that Apollo is in fact, offline. Huh. Of course, Silence has some telling comments about this. This is a graveyard. The charnel house of knowledge. Reaching the control room, we find a priority message for Elizabeth from Gaia, dated 20 years ago. Elizabeth. This message serves to inform you of an unforeseen and catastrophic anomaly. 
In it, she informs us that she received an unknown transmission that turned her subordinate functions into chaotic, self-aware AIs. And due to this, Hades attempted to seize control of the terraforming system and render Earth uninhabitable. To stop this, Gaia resolved to destroy herself, which stopped the immediate crisis but didn't solve it long term. For without her, the terraforming system will become increasingly erratic, before ceasing operations altogether. As a solution for the long term, Gaia ordered the Cradle Facility were in to gestate a reinstantiation of Elizabeth Sobek, in this case, Aloy, with the hopes that when she reaches maturity, she'll be able to gain access to this very facility and view this very message, as well as access other Zero Dawn facilities, thus rebuild Gaia and the terraforming system with it. However, just as Gaia finished laying out her plan, Hades launched a virus that dissolved the code shackles holding all her functions in place, allowing them to escape, which in turn explains how Hades ended up in that Horus we saw earlier. The virus then begins corrupting data across all systems, including the Alpha Registry, meaning that the hatch won't open for Aloy, just as it hadn't many hours earlier. Despite this catastrophic setback, a defiant guide declares her unwavering faith that Elizabeth, Aloy, will find a way, directing her to the ruins of Guy Prime to find the Master Override, which is in fact the kill switch Ted Farrell pressed Elizabeth to create for Gaia back at Zero Dawn HQ. After one final instruction to destroy Hades before repairing the system, Gaia finally destroys herself with one final parting word. I only wish that I could hear your voice again. <sighs> Aloy, of course, is more than a little shaken by this revelation, not least by the fact that, as she sees it, she doesn't have a mother. Silence counters this point, but as he speaks, you can almost taste the bitterness attached to his words, perhaps envious of Aloy's sharply heightened importance, his own pride and ego taking a hit. He promptly cuts short their call, but not before instructing Aloy to meet him at Gaia Prime's ruins. The flames and heal the world. How tragic to learn you're a person of towering importance. It seems you have a destiny to fulfill. So when you're done feeling sorry for yourself, go to the bitter climb. I'll be waiting above in Gaia Prime's ruins. With her path clear, it's time to leave, though not before meeting with the rest of the Nora. As she exits the hatch, they can only look on in amazement, with Jezza and Landra bowing in reverence to her approach. Landra suddenly begging for forgiveness, having done a complete 180. Forgive. Knowing the tribe wouldn't understand what she saw, Aloy explains it as Old Mother telling her that she was created to lift a curse, as well as where to go to find the means of doing just so that it was Old Mother's wish for her to do so, and that she'll, at the very least, try. I don't know yet. Uh, Immediately upon hearing this, all of the Nora fall to their knees and bow before her, the High Matriarchs chanting her praise. This is where I feel the Nora reach peak absurdity. I know this is going to sound incredibly harsh given the circumstance, but it's something I simply can't ignore. Aloy here summarizes it best. First you shun me, now this? That right there is the crux of it all. They've gone from treating her less than a person due to circumstances no fault of her own, to suddenly holding her up to some paragon of all their ideals and beliefs, one that's theirs and theirs alone. All because of a narrow mindset as a result of their isolationist tendencies and aversion to outside influences. Having been an outcast most of her life, as well as now having seen the world beyond the confines of the Nora's extremely limited worldview, Aloy doesn't take this sudden reversal all too well, vehemently chastising them for this, and rightly so in my opinion. The scene ends with Aloy instructing anyone strong enough and willing to fight to head to Meridian, with Tirsa, presumably speaking for all the matriarchs in that moment, giving her blessing. Before we go, we can speak to some of the Nora in the mountain, such as Varl and Tab, and even Lanzra, but the most important among them is Tirsa, for it's by speaking with her that we can finally learn the truth about Rost, about why he was made an outcast for life. It's pretty tragic to say the least, but I strongly recommend that you give it a listen. Years before Aloy's birth, Ross had a wife and a daughter who were murdered at the hands of bandits that had inexplicably invaded the Sacred Lands. His daughter was among the last to be murdered, and her body was left just outside the Sacred Lands, the bandits knowing that the Nora wouldn't break taboo to collect them. As Tirsa tells it, it was then that a grief-stricken Ross begged the Matriarchs to be made a Death Seeker, someone who, like a Seeker, can leave the Sacred Lands but can never return, for their soul has already been given to Old Mother, while the body wanders in search of death, all while bringing death to others in the process. Granted this right, and after returning the bodies of the slain, Ross set out in pursuit of the murderers. He returned a full year later, presumably having traveled much of the known world, successful in his mission, but terribly wounded, collapsing just beyond the Sacred Lands. Though he should have died where he lay, another hunter brought him back. Some speculate this hunter to be Odd Grata, another outcast you can meet early on in the embrace whom Ross has taken a special interest in helping, but this has never been confirmed. Ross' return put the matriarchs in a difficult position. Due to being a death seeker, he no longer had a place among the Nora and should have been driven out, yet conversely they couldn't bring themselves to do that. As a compromise, they offered to make him an outcast, so long as he never spoke of this arrangement to anyone, an arrangement that Ross was more than happy to agree to. He resolved to live the rest of his life in solitude, right up until the matriarchs turned to him for another matter. That of Aloy.
Leaving the Nora again, we head for the Bitter Climb, the path of the mountain that is home to Gaia Prime. Along the way, we come across large groups of machines, not corrupted, but seemingly drawn to what is, in essence, Gaia's grave. They can be easily avoided, though this can be a bit of an exercise in patience as you scurry from tall grass to tall grass. The Stormbird, however, can't be avoided. The fight itself isn't anything to write home about, but I really like the setting, amidst Gaia's ruins during a raging snowstorm. I'm listening. I don't know why, I just really like it. Uh, each journey begins with a single step, I guess. Once the Stormbird's taken care of, we're free to press on to Guy Prime and bear witness to her sacrifice. What her sacrifice entailed was literally blowing up an entire fucking mountain. I did this. Cracked the inside of the mountain like it was an egg. It's a striking set piece, like a proverbial middle finger to whoever sent the signal trying to end the world. It's also rather haunting, its cavernous silence punctuated by occasional rumbles as whatever remains of its structures continue to crumble. We learn from Silence that he's been here before, which at this point comes as a surprise to absolutely no one. Following a path he's laid out for us, we reach his workshop, with a gene locked door at the far end. This is exactly the kind of place I expected to find you in, Silence. Thank you. He's also here, in hologram form, and we can learn that he's been coming here ever since the mountain exploded, the guarding machines useful in keeping his workshop protected from any would-be trespassers. Beginning our exploration, we find a data point that tells us that due to the rapid advance of the Feral Swarm, the Zero Dawn Alphas were forced to shack up in Gaia Prime instead of taking up residence with everyone else in another bunker called Elysium, with some taken in stride, others not so much. Weeks. You realize I just lost 350 kilos of pre-code smug comics in transit. Diving deeper into the ruins, we find audio logs from a couple of them, either wondering how things will be after the end, or lamenting decisions made in the desperate final days at Zero Dawn HQ. There's a thought for future generations. We eventually reach Elizabeth's office and find that none of her things are unpacked, as well as some journal entries. Though corrupted, Silence tells us to scan them as the Focus can repair them, though it could take a considerable amount of time. These entries will be repaired and made available to us over various stages of the endgame. That aside, the fact that none of her things are unpacked implies that something happened to Elizabeth. That something is revealed in the next room, where we find what appears to be a memorial of some kind. To Elizabeth. Listening to an audio recording attached to it, we learn that an access port seal malfunctioned, leaving a wide enough gap for a signal to go through that would alert the Feral Swarm of Guy's location, and that it could only be fixed from the outside. From there, we switch to a visual recording of the event. Well, I'm not going out there. Now, who I signed up for? Either we send someone out, or all of this was for nothing. It should be Liz's decision. So when is she going to get here? She said five minutes. You don't think... Oh no... Okay, everyone. I've repaired the seal. Gaia? Seal closure at 1.4 millimeters. Confirmed. Elizabeth, no. We'll find a way to bring you back in. It's not gonna happen. The swarm's too close. Really. It's alright. Gaia's complete. She'll take care of things from here on out. That's what she does. Not like this. There's so much we- Guys, you know me, I'm... I'm no good at endings. At letting things end, so, um... Let's not. So... Happy trails, Liz. And, uh... See you around. Yeah. Take care of each other, alright? Liz. I'm okay with this. It's a scene that pulls on the heartstrings, Elizabeth's final act of heroism sacrificing herself in a bid to ensure that life on Earth had a future, the one we're currently in now. Silence, being who he is, puts this down to Elizabeth simply being better than everyone else, but Aloy knows better. It wasn't her sheer force of will, but her sentimentality, her love of life and the dream of life after the swarm, and because of that, she willingly threw herself into the fire to make sure it would come to fruition. Before continuing, Aloy makes one final remark. She said she wanted to go home. Maybe. What? Nothing. It's time to go on. From here, things start to get weird, and very concerning. We start to find audio data points from and about Ted, who's locked himself away in his own private bunker called Thebes. 
Shortly after Elizabeth's death, he begins to ask questions about Guy's systems, which in theory he should know nothing about, which worries the Alphas, but they eventually brush it off. Okay. I mean, maybe I should ignore him. He's buried in this pyramid with the Hola Hola girls and Panta Antimon Cuckoos. What can he do? The data points from Ted himself suggest otherwise. Directing them to Elizabeth, despite her being dead, we hear him seemingly start to unravel, questioning the efficacy of the project, in particular with regards to what the new humans might learn from Apollo. The last data point before reaching the control room suggests that he's found a solution, which makes Aloy rather uneasy. I can make it better, Liz. With a single stroke, make it all go away. I really don't like the direction this is going. Upon entering the control room, we make a startling discovery. The corpses of the Alphas, presumably suffocated, for as silence bluntly points out, Because there was none inside the chamber. There's another hologram recording, where we learn what happened to the Alphas, and more. I'm locked out of court control. Alpha clearance overridden. What the hell is Omega clearance? Oh no. Alpha personnel. Sorry to alarm you, but I need you to listen, okay? To what I'm about to say. This isn't easy. See, uh, I've, uh, please, stop trying to access the system, okay? See, see, what this is about is, um, I said stop trying to access the goddamn system. And what, what I'm trying to say is I can't stop thinking about the ones who come after us. Those innocents, those blameless men, and, 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 and women. We're gonna give them knowledge? Like it's a gift? Ted, Ted, we've talked about this before. Apollo has 3,000 plus failsafe conditions. It's not a gift, it's a disease. They're the cure, and we're gonna give them the disease. Our disease? No, we can't. And it's not too late. If we're willing to sacrifice. Ted, it doesn't need to be like this. It already is, Samina. I did it three minutes ago. I've purged Apollo. It's gone. All of it. Every copy. A sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice. It's cultural obliteration, you crazy bastard. Millennia of culture. I'm sorry. Really, I am. But sometimes, to protect innocence, innocents have to die. Emergency alert. Apollo, purged and the Alpha's dead, all thanks to the reckless narcissism of Ted Farrow, desperate to cover up his involvement in bringing the world to an end, destroying all of human knowledge to do so. And not just Apollo. As you explore the world, you'll notice that all of the animals are small, such as foxes, boars, and turkeys, and yet we see no large animals, such as deer or bears. That's because of Ted's purge, for Artemis' rewilding protocol hinged on the new humans having the knowledge to introduce stage 2 and up organisms into the wild, knowledge they'd have gotten from Apollo, but didn't. This leads to a theory I have regarding the port seal malfunction, that Ted was also behind that somehow. I have to stress that this is entirely circumstantial. There's no physical or written evidence supporting it, only that the timeline of events seems to fit, though this could be entirely coincidental. There's also a data point from Ted at Elizabeth's memorial, where he doesn't seem all that choked up about Elizabeth's passing. I've theorized that, since he managed to gain access to Zero Dawn's systems through his Omega clearance, that he intentionally caused the port seal to malfunction, hazarding a guess that Elizabeth would willingly sacrifice herself to fix it. Up to that point, Elizabeth was responsible for managing Ted, keeping him at arm's length from Gaia. Now that she was out of the picture, Ted had free reign to purge Apollo, with no one being the wiser until it was too late. Again, this is all very circumstantial, and the malfunction could very well just be a narrative device to ensure Elizabeth's sacrifice would happen. As of this writing, we have no concrete answers, and may never know. Grabbing the master override, we begin to make our way back to Silence's workshop. Upon arriving, we find Silence. In the flesh. He's come to make his final farewell, but before he goes, he wants to tell Aloy the rest of his story, specifically about his involvement with the Eclipse. He reveals that he didn't just assist them, but he actually founded the whole damn thing having found Hades in the Titan we saw earlier, and served it in return for any and all of Hades' knowledge. Silence found the Eclipse to do its bidding, turning to the Shadow Karja to build an army, manipulating them by having Hades masquerade as the buried shadow of Karja myth. 
Desperate to retake Meridian, Helios and Bahavas willingly agreed to serve it, unaware that Hades cared not for Meridian, but the Spire. That's because the Spire is one of the towers Gaia built to send out the deactivation codes, produced by Minerva to shut down the feral robots. Using the same method, Hades wants to send on an activation signal to wake them back up, and thus wipe the Earth clean of life once more. Silence didn't care about Meridian either, so caught up in setting up the Eclipse Focus Network to Hades' specs, though he does admit to being troubled when the Eclipse first raised an ancient war machine, questioning Hades about its intentions. Due to this, Hades issued a kill order on him, putting him on the run ever since. It was not long after this that Silence heard of the kill order placed on Aloy, and after observing her for some time, resolved to help her in her search for answers, though not entirely selflessly. Before leaving, Silence leaves Aloy a lance of his own design to fit the Master Override to, along with everything else in his shop, reasoning that it was hers to begin with. I was merely... trespassing. Doing just that, Aloy now has the means to destroy Hades, and so begins to head to Meridian to warn Avad of the coming Eclipse Assault. The strike. After what happened with Durval, I know he'll defend the city. With the Spire. Returning to Meridian, we immediately go to see Avad and warn him of the coming threat. Murad is there as well, and to them both, Aloy begins to explain just what that threat is, stressing that they must defend the Spire at all costs. Not truly understanding, Avad, on Murad's insistence, orders the Vanguard to be stationed there, knowing Erend won't question it, along with Aloy suggesting that the City Guard defend the Western Ridge. There's a quick and awkward cut to black as Aloy explains everything that she knows to Avad before we meet with Murad at the Palace Gates, where he informs us that allies from across the Sundom have come to aid in the defense, most coming for Aloy by name. For me. Don't be so humble. Murad also states that there's been no movement in the West, which conveniently affords us the chance to complete any other side activities we wish, as well as a chance to speak with our assembled allies, both at the city and at the Spire. Damn right! Once we feel we're sufficiently ready, we head to Olin's old apartment, where Aloy gets some much needed rest before the Titanic clash to come. How could you sleep, Elizabeth, with a weight like this pressing on you? How did you rust after you lost your family? Silence? Are you there? I guess I shouldn't ask ghosts for advice. The following morning, we arrive at the palace to witness a scene of utter devastation. The Eclipse destroy an entire section of the ridge overlooking the jewel, allowing their war machines, ancient and corrupted, to march on Meridian and the Spire unhindered. Aloy immediately jumps into action, ordering everyone to man the guns and prepare for the assault. However, before this can happen, an explosion rocks the palace and out steps Helis, who quickly goes to bloody work. Despite Avad's protest, Aloy jumps into the fray, thus initiating the final showdown with Helis. You have fixed me long enough. You should have fought me in a sun ring then. The fight itself isn't all that great, to be honest. It's pretty gimmicky, requiring you to damage Helis by exploding blaze barrels next to him as he's almost impervious to ranged and melee attacks, his own attacks doing considerable damage, which makes me ending this fight with an arrow somewhat hilarious in hindsight. Despite what I just said, I'll give Gorilla some credit here in trying to make the fight interesting with its gimmickiness, even if it falls a little flat. With the defeated Helis on his knees, wondering aloud how it all came to be, we've got a few choices in how we deal with him, though as I see it, there's only one true choice. Was not meant to be. Chosen. Hades only chose you because you're a fool. A sadistic butcher too stupid to see you were being used. Your whole life was a failure. And soon, no one will even remember you. Turn your face to the sun and think about that! And so ends Helis, Aloy having finally avenged Rost. With Duran's mad dog out of the way, we can finally make for the Western Ridge. Slotting in on a slip wire, we arrive to find it under assault by a Deathbringer, making use of an Osram cannon to take it down. 
This is pretty much how this entire stage of the battle goes, using this cannon to defend the ridge against waves of machines, with each wave building in intensity before ending with a corrupted Stormbird. Despite our best efforts, more and more machines keep coming, and eventually the gates behind them are destroyed, nearly crushing Aloy and rendering her unconscious. She comes to briefly, just as a Deathbringer stomps on by, dragging Hades behind it, before falling unconscious again. She's reawakened by Teb, who informs her that Hades has reached the Spire. Aloy! Teb? My old mother, you survived. I thought you were killed. The others, are they... No, no. Wounded, but alive, mostly. The machines blasted through, then kept going. They marched on the spire, dragging that thing with them. Take care of the others, Teb. I've gotta go. So begins a race to the spire. We cut through the village below the mesa, completely destroyed, as well as the great elevator, with cards of forces locked in desperate struggle with corrupted machines. On the way there, we see the spire lit up like a Christmas tree, signaling that Hades has begun its transmission, awakening ancient machines across the world, making an already desperate situation all the more so. Reaching the top, we find Talana, Erend, and Varl miraculously alive, though the same unfortunately can't be said for the rest of the spire's defenders, it seems. They're just as relieved to see Aloy alive, considering what happened at the ridge, and resolve to help her with confronting Hades. We were about to go over the top anyway, right? Right. Hawk and Thrush, let's go. Reaching the spire, Hades begins to taunt Aloy, before taking control of the same Deathbringer that brought it up there, though I do have to wonder how, given that sizable chunks of the Ascent have been destroyed, though that could have been done after Hades' arrival. At this point, none of that matters, and the Deathbringer immediately unloads all its weaponry on Aloy. To make matters worse, there's a little timer at the top of the screen. Should it reach zero, then game over. Hades will have permanently ended the world. Over the course of the fight, as you damage the Deathbringer, Hades will call upon more corrupted machines to its aid, turning an already hectic fight into pure chaos. Eventually, the Deathbringer goes down, which oddly puts a kibosh on the timer, but at least it allows us some time to mop up any corrupted machines that may still be around. In any event, it's time to finish Hades. System threat imminent. I'm more than a threat. Stabbing Hades with the lance, Aloy is pulled into some weird digital realm where she uses the Master Override to purge Hades. Master Override armed. To activate state name and rank. Elizabeth Sobek. Alpha Prime. Master Override activated. Purging Extinction Protocol. Using the Spire, the Purge sends out a signal similar to what Hades was using, this time shutting down all the machines that attempted to reawaken. With the threat of Hades now eliminated, the sun shining over Meridian in the Spire, we can begin to celebrate a job well done. The world, as we know it, has been saved. Okay, Gaia. Uh, sorry about that. Where was I? The last scene of the game has us following Aloy as she calmly rides through a barren plain, approaching some ruins, all while we listen to one of Elizabeth's recovered journals, with her telling Gaia a story from her childhood. The ruins are in fact that of Elizabeth's childhood home. If you think back to when she spoke to Silence at her memorial in Gaia Prime, Aloy mentions that Elizabeth wanted to go home and is undoubtedly looking to see if she managed to. She did, in the end, and we're treated with an emotional moment as Aloy grieves over her genetic mother, while Elizabeth poignantly tells Gaia what she would have wished for her daughter if she ever had one. I would have wanted her to be curious and willful, unstoppable, even. 
but with enough compassion to heal the world just a little bit. Aloy then finds a pendant resembling Earth in Elizabeth's clutches. Taking it in her hands with a Larmoyan smile, she holds it close to her chest as the camera pans away, bringing the story of Horizon Zero Dawn to a bittersweet end. Anyway, that's all I've got for now, Gaia. Time to tuck in. I wish you a pleasant sleep, Elizabeth. Thank you. I'll catch you tomorrow. Except it isn't the end. Taking a page out of Marvel's book, after the credits roll, we're treated to another cutscene, back at the Spire. A group of curious Karja approach the supposed corpse of Hades, only for the orb to suddenly come to life. A red... thing, I don't even know what to call it, goes flying out and off somewhere. That somewhere just so happens to be Silence, who traps the red thing in some sort of cage. Turns out Hades isn't actually dead and is now Silence's prisoner, with plans to find out just who sent the signal that woke it, setting the stage for the next game and next story. So much to discuss. So much you never revealed. Your masters, for example. The ones who sent the signal that woke you. Knowledge has its rewards, don't you think? Well, let's begin. And so ends the story of Horizon Zero Dawn, a true masterpiece of video game storytelling. For what is again its first crack at the open world genre, Guerrilla absolutely nailed the narrative, giving us both a story that will make you laugh, cry, angry, and smile, with themes and concepts that will leave you deep in thought and wanting to know more. On top of this, they have given us a main character in Aloy that has become one of gaming's most iconic in the last few years, supported by an interesting and well-rounded ensemble of supporting characters, all transposed onto a beautiful open world that you can get lost in for hours at a time. All this put together has given us an open world narrative that has captured the imaginations of gamers all over, coupled with the boundless and fully deserved praise it's received, back then and to this day. Though not flawless by any stretch and not entirely unique in certain aspects, it serves well as yet another example and testament of what can be achieved in the medium, all in spite of the many question marks that hovered over its head prior to release. It set a strong foundation for what would become Horizon Forbidden West, as well as establishing a franchise that can proudly stand alongside Sony's finest IPs. For that and more, the team at Guerrilla Games should be proud.